Ladies and gentlemen, hello. I hope that this episode finds you having a kick-ass day. Before we get into it, the business side of the house. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Ladder Life Insurance. If you're anything like me, you likely have not put much thought into life insurance until relatively recently. Fortunately, Ladder makes it quick and easy to get you covered for your life insurance needs. You can log on with your phone or laptop and you can apply. And with only a few minutes, you're going to find out instantly whether or not you're approved. After that, you can decide whether or not to move forward. The plans are offered at a personalized rate that can flex as your needs change. Prices are affordable. There are no hidden fees and you can cancel at any time. Since life insurance costs more as you age, now is the time to cross it off your list. Like I said, if you're like me, you probably don't think about it. But if you have loved ones in your life or people that would be left behind, I would highly consider putting some thought into this. And it's actually what changed my mind about it. If you're interested, you can lock in your best rate today and get your family covered with Ladder. Go to ladderlife.com slash cleared hot. That's L-A-D-D-E-R life dot com slash cleared hot. This episode is also brought to you by Relief Band. Did you know that one third of Americans regularly suffer from nausea? I'm not one of them, but I have been seasick a few times and it has stuck with me for days and it is the most miserable experience that I have had. It's uncomfortable, feels like you're going to throw up and it couldn't focus. It ruins everything else I was trying to do and it just kept going and going and going. And that is why I'm so stoked about Relief Band. It is the number one FDA-cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraine, hangover, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and much more. 100% drug-free, non-drowsy, provides all-natural relief with zero side effects for as long as needed. The technology was originally developed over 20 years ago in hospitals to relieve nausea from patients, but now, through Relief Band, it is available to the masses. It stimulates a nerve in the wrist that travels to the part of the brain that controls nausea. Then it blocks the signal your brain is sending to your stomach, telling you that you need to go blah. It's the only over-the-counter wearable device that has been used in hospitals and oncology clinics to treat nausea and vomiting. I personally don't get hangovers or car sickness or seasickness, but I know people that do, and they have personally told me that it has worked for them. Ensure nausea is never the reason to miss out on life's important moments. Right now, Relief Band has an exclusive offer just for the listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use the promo code CLEAREDHOT, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping and no question asked 30-day money-back guarantee. R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use the promo code CLEAREDHOT for 20% off. Speaking of things that can probably make a difference in your life, this episode is also brought to you by Theragun. The stress of daily life weighs on all of us. And whether you're an elite athlete or just a regular person, trying to get through the day, muscle pain and muscle tension is a real thing. And that is why I personally choose to use Theragun. It is a handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power. And now it's as quiet as an electric toothbrush. The all-new Gen 4 Theragun has a proprietary brushless motor that's so quiet you will wonder if it's actually on. It's going to soothe your aching muscles with Theragun's signature power, amplitude, and effectiveness. This thing is in my daily routine post-jujitsu. My neck will get tight sometimes, and I can sit there and just work it out with the Theragun. You can try Theragun for 30 days. There's no substitute for the Theragun Gen 4, and with the OLED screen, personalized Theragun app, and the quiet power you need. Starting at only $199, you can go to theragun.com slash cleared hot right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's theragun.com slash cleared hot. T-H-E-R-A-G-U-N dot com slash cleared hot. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Honey. And no, I'm not talking about the food. I'm talking about the pre-browser extension that has made my online shopping life a lot easier. Between going to work, home, school, kids, relationships, the world, whatever it is that might be occupying your time, you've got enough to think about already. You don't need to add more things to the plate. And that's why Honey is here to make at least one aspect of your life a lot less complicated, and that is saving money. You can just add Honey to your computer. Like I said, it's a pre-browser extension, but the beauty of it is is they don't sell your data. 
And you can shop on lots of your favorite websites just like you normally do. If Honey finds a coupon, it will automatically tell you, applying the correct codes and dropping the price in a flash. There's no thinking, no remembering, no searching, just blissful automation. It's already found over $1 billion in savings, you know, automatically, if you're into that kind of thing. It's literally a no-brainer. In just a few seconds, you could have one less thing to worry about. So what are you waiting for? And from a personal perspective, I do a little bit of online shopping from time to time. I added the browser, and in the last two days, I was actually looking for a pair of shoes and a shirt for a trip I'm getting ready to go on. Both websites were getting ready to check out, and bing, looked for nothing. Honey gave it to me, and I saved some money. If you're interested in giving it a try, go to joinhoney.com slash cleared hot. That's join, J-O-I-N, honey, like the normal spelling, dot com slash cleared hot. Lastly, this episode is brought to you by the most delicious cereal on the face of the planet. If you've been trying to cut down on carbs and sugar and unhealthy food, but you love cereal, don't worry. I have the solution for you, and it's Magic Spoon. It's still early in the year. We're probably all trying to eat better, but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has amazing flavors that you're going to love without all the bad stuff. They just released a brand new variety pack, which is now featuring peanut butter. They released peanut butter as a limited edition flavor in 2020, and it sold out three times. The peanut butter has gotten so much love that they decided to keep it permanent and add it to the bestseller variety pack, which also includes frosty, fruity, and cocoa. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. And that nets out to about 140 calories per serving. It's keto-free, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. And don't be afraid to mix and match. I dare you. Mix the peanut butter with the cocoa and tell me that it doesn't taste like a peanut butter cup. Go to magicspoon.com slash cleared hot to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code cleared hot at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash cleared hot and use the code cleared hot to save $5 off. My guest today is Chad Wright, a former Navy SEAL and current badass. His story of getting into the military and actually getting into the SEAL community is pretty crazy. He did some things that uh, I probably wouldn't have had the balls to do. And his story of what he's doing now, the, the ultra endurance, and I may be, I'm, might be describing that incorrectly. I'm pretty sure he describes it in depth when we were talking. But the length of distance that he is running now and the goals that he has for himself now, they are unbelievable, which is why I said former SEAL, current badass. Now I'm going to shut up. Episode 169 with Chad Wright. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Can't be cleared hot. Look how good you look. Radio check. Oh, yeah. It's a good check. I got you, Lima Charlie. <laughs> hey, look, Andy, before we get started, man. We're already started. Oh, well, well, before we dig into whatever. <laughs> I don't even know what we're talking about today, dude. But I start uh, every podcast that way. Okay, that's perfect. I'm confused about a few things. Far away. So there's a, you know, everybody has their favorite Navy SEAL these days, and, you know, there's plenty of ultra running Navy SEALs out there. I only know of two, you and Mr. Goggins. Well, and, and so that's my question. Why have lowly old Chad out for a conversation and not David Goggins? You know, it, well, it, 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 you know I'm just confused, man. Um, I get asked about David a lot. And I will get asked about whether or not I want to have him on the podcast. The reality is I don't think he would come on, and I don't think the conversation would be very fun. I think we have a disagreement on specifically and only how he portrays his military career. So I have, uh, I have some criticism that would only be understood by people from our community. And that criticism, though, I think would better be saved because I look at what he's doing now and the reality is regardless of how I feel about him, he's out there motivating millions of people. Yeah. So what's the point of the criticism? Uh, let it fly. 
Not I'm, I don't want to shotgun anybody with anything. His platform is massive. A magnitude of order or order is greater than my own. So let him go out and, and do great things. That, and that's my exact same viewpoint, man. Is you know, there's I, I think there's a lot of things that that are said in a way that are dangerous for for your everyday person. And you know, if, if you're holding yourself to this standard, uh, that that's portrayed by him and others. Yeah, it's not sustainable, man. And, and I, but I'm the same way, man. It's like ultimately, the message I think has helped. Yes hundreds of thousands of people without a doubt so i think the issue is people try to replicate exactly what they are doing because yeah. there's two things you see somebody who's incredibly inspirational and aspirational i'll use jocko as an example yeah the dude gets up at 4 30 in the morning or probably or a little bit before because most of the time is i'll see you man he's put in 4 30 and for him um he does okay with less sleep i think than most i think mm -hmm. that the number i last heard for recommended sleep is about eight hours there's both sides of that. Some people need 10. Some people can crank it out on five or six. If you're somebody who needs 10, but you're looking at somebody who is getting up at 4.30 every every morning and you feel that you have to do that too, mm -hmm. and it crushes you, you're missing the point of the message. Mm -hmm. He is putting out there his disciplined behavior and the impact that it has on his life. You could set your alarm for a different time in the day. And get up then, discipline. You know what I mean? So there's yeah. the message, and then I think the mistake, and I don't think it's bad that people try to emulate those behaviors. I think it's inspirational and aspirational, like I said. But if it's not working for you, mm -hmm. don't grind yourself into dust in the attempt to be somebody else. Take the message that they're portraying and put that into your life. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> it, 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 man, I have, a, I have a weird take on discipline anyways, and we can get back to that. We can pick up on that later. But, you know... Um, I, I guess I'm really honored and humbled to be here, man. Uh, don't you know, be, believe uh, well, me. Well, no, I'm a, I, I, you, you I'm don't, a moron dude, stumbling my way through. You life. don't you, you, <laughs> look, man. You're you're little. You're I, now. I realize you're a humble person. I I, I, be, I believe that. But you, brother, I've been listening to you for quite a while. You're actually one of the first Navy SEALs that I ever listened to on a podcast. And I'm a Navy SEAL. Don't I always wonder how many people listen how many other SEALs listen to me. You know what I mean? I, listen to my podcast. I hope not many listen to mine. <laughs> I'm Even right though there some, with you, some of my friends like they'll hit me up and they'll be like they'll laugh and they'll be like, thank you for just being you. Because I'm an idiot and I say dumb stuff. Yeah. And, I, and I'm just But but you also say some really you, you also articulate things in a in a very real way that have helped me in my own mission. And, um, you know, I guess that's the reason I, I'm so honored and humbled to be here. You know, I know you could have had anybody. And that was a joke, that question in the beginning. Why would you have me instead of David Goggins? I'm obviously totally different. You know, that was a that was a joke, you know. but It's one that's not addressed often, though. People will f uh, skirt around that issue. And that's the, it, it, the way I describe it is exactly how I feel. I think what he's doing is awesome. But it's not, you know what I mean? It's not the right place for either of us. Whereas I think you and I could probably have a conversation that could hopefully lever, you know, lever people to their next level or yeah, give them motivation or inspiration. You know what I mean? And I, I think a lot of that, there's more opportunity for that with you than there is an argument and a disagreement that could potentially negatively impact the SEAL teams between he and I. A hundred percent. Well, I, and, and here's the thing while we're on that subject. I think that we can raise another million dollars for the Navy SEAL Foundation. I think we can raise $2 million for the Navy SEAL Foundation. Let me tell you how we can do this. I think that we need to have – have you ever heard of a last man standing race? Are we going to talk about running? Because I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> you're not part of it. I would, you're not, you're not going to be running. Hold on, though. Can I be the coach with the clipboard and a whistle using only negative feedback as reinforcement and motivation? Let, Yes, I'm it. No, yes, that's I'm perfect. In. All right. So here's what we're here's what here's my vision. There's this race format, and, and I, I've I've competed in a few of these races. It already sounds terrible just based off the name. I think I know where this is going. It's it's last man. So so what this last man standing is, is it's a four point one six mile loop, and you have one hour to run that loop. Okay. So if you run it in fifty minutes, you get a ten minute break. If you run it, you know, 6, 59, 59. Might as well keep on yeah, going. Yeah, you just keep on going, right? <laughs> but but see, this race, this this race format, and, and it totals up to be every 24 hours is 100 miles. So okay. it's easy to keep track of the distance. But it takes 
speed out of the equation. And it boils everything down to sheer grit and durability. Yeah. Because, dude, you only got to go four miles per hour. What do most people pick for a pace on that? Like, do, so, they, do they try to get rest or do they just really throttle it back and just consistently try to move? It, it's, I, for me personally, it's different for everybody else. For me personally, I did one called the Mid-State Mile uh, a couple months ago. I think it was in June, and I won that race. Um, I'll tell that story here in just a little bit. I finished last almost every single loop. So I would come in, I would have maybe a minute to sit down, shove some food in my mouth, top my water bottle off, and get back out there. Now, there's strategy to it, though, because as the field dwindles and it gets down to just you and a few other really strong dudes, you can start, you, when, when you see them falter, you can show a little strength, right? Mm-hmm. And, and Talking you, about psychological warfare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> dude, this format boils it down and, and takes speed out of the equation. It's all about grit and durability. Imagine if we had me and David Goggins and maybe even somebody like Cam Haynes or somebody. That would but be a, look, actually, that's an excellent addition. The gladiators. The, dude, we're the gladiators, man. Give the people what they want, right? The three of us last man standing i'd call you guys the three horsemen i don't know if i'd call you the gladiators well i'm just saying we we essentially <laughs> we essentially are the the we, we're out here doing these crazy things and people like to watch them right that's in all three of your wheelhouses yeah, okay narrated by you and joe rogan i mean i'm in and, i can't talk for joe or cam or david but i'm in well, well that's that's the thing is <laughs> look man that's the thing i've had this vision for for a while and i've never put it out publicly but i'm just saying man what do, and these races when 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 you're talking when, when you're running this race man and you get 30 40 50 hours deep into this thing like it's fun to watch oh you're vision questing at that point I oh imagine. it's brutal man <laughs> and it's head to head dude and it would be so it would be just be such a grueling awesome event and i just see it I just think I think we could raise a million dollars doing that. I don't think it would be hard to raise a million dollars doing that. If we if we had that lineup of individuals, Correct. you know, promoting the event. And and it's just so much fun to watch. I mean, the la- the, the one I did in Midstate Mile, man. The last couple laps, I'm running against this dude. He's a he's a national. He's on the American National Ultra Running Team, super strong athlete, Greg Armstrong. And um he's literally pushing his body his body's shutting down. He, yeah. he, he's pushed beyond. And, and dude, the last lap, it's on video. It's on my Instagram. This dude comes through the finish line, and I'm waiting for him. And he comes through the finish line, and his quads are locking up. And he just crosses the finish line and literally crumbles and collapses uh, onto the ground. And, and to be honest, I've been battling this dude for 30 straight hours. 30 hours, man. And um, I'll tell you how I beat him later, but... This dude, I, I could not talk to him without crying. Just you, how, you don't get a lot of opportunities in life. We we did in the SEAL teams, but in regular life, not even like that though. Like you're describing with a that long with just one individual back and forth. That's I mean that we worked in some interesting situations, but most I mean I'm two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. You know what I mean? Surrounded by your buddies, not an endurance event like that where bodies are shutting down. Yeah, like that's that's a very uh, intimate and personal battle between the two. Well, at the end when the, at the end, two yeah. people are remaining, <laughs> and, and you you see this man crumble, and you know it's like he he knew he couldn't beat me at that point. Now, previous to that, I didn't think I could beat him because mm-hmm. he had a resume that would put mine to shame, you know. And um, you, he knew he couldn't beat me. He was literally for about four hours, he was running just so I could push myself harder. That's the only reason he stayed in the race. He knew he couldn't win. But he, he just kept going. He didn't want to cheat me. <laughs> he didn't want to cheat me out of finding my limit. Now, at 30 hours, I felt like I could go another 30 hours. I never found really? my limit, right? But Greg wanted to, to continue to push me for me, not for him. And that's what was so beautiful about it. Does that make sense to you? It does. And that is, like I said, that's, I think, a much more intimate experience between the two of you. Yeah. 
What would the terrain on that race? Was it largely flat? Were you guys navigating some uh, altitude gain and loss? Yeah, so that race had, um, it was like 350 feet of gain per and loss per mile. So, per mile? Per mile. Ooh. So I think it clocked up to be like, I don't know, it was like 33 or 35,000 feet of elevation gain and loss well, over the course of that 30 hours. All right, so let's talk about the three horsemen race that obviously is going to happen now. I think it should be double that elevation gain and loss. If possible, it should be uphill both ways. Here, here's the problem with that. With this race format, with this event that we're going to do and raise a million dollars, um, the harder the course is, the easier the race is because the sooner it will end. Mm. The easier the terrain is, I see what the you're harder saying. the race is, man. Yeah, because you'll basically you'll crush people way early. Yeah, because like I'm I'm good at climbing, man. Because I live, dude. I live on a 500 acre ranch in the mountains. Yeah. Um, I don't go to town. Like I just stay in the woods all the time. I'm surrounded by seven, eight thousand acres of public land. And you so know, the hardest way would be no flat, ele- yes, flat, <laughs> paved road. It would, so you know you could make the distance, and then it would truly become a between the ears evolution. A hundred percent, bro. Ooh, I like this. <laughs> we would, can make it even harder. Do it on a treadmill. Oh no! Man. In front of a wall with nothing <laughs> on it. <laughs> No scenery change whatsoever. That's got to be uh, that. Yeah, that'd be absolutely miserable. So here's how we'll do it: the three horsemen. We're gonna get three Connex boxes. You're gonna do it in isolation from your competitors. You're gonna be running alone in the box, not knowing whether they're still going or not. That that would be freaking insane. That dude. would break people mentally and emotionally. Do you realize we could televise that? I would only want to televise. I would enjoy narrating the end when the fucking paint started coming off the wall of the mind and they just (laughs) you 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 guys you guys that are that are hosting and and talk y'all don't need to come in until we're like a day into this thing yeah you know what i mean because the the whole front half look man (sighs) when i run a hundred mile race i run 95 miles for five miles of growth like all the growth comes at the end you know what i mean so yeah you guys it wouldn't get interesting until we got deep into this thing you know what i mean but Anyways, I, I mean, it's an interesting, it's a hell of a format. I, the three of you, if it was flat, man, I wonder what would be possible. How far, would you set it up the same way, 4.1 uh, miles you said it was? 4.16 miles. Would you set yep. it up exactly the same, so it's 100 per day? It That makes it easy, yeah, to keep up with distance and, and all that, you know. And, and these races that are done all over the country, um, you know, this isn't a new format. This yeah. isn't my idea. It's just a, a certain I, – I just love the format because I'm not the fastest. I'm not the strongest. The reason I win is because I'm a little more patient than people. Yeah. I can stay a little more present than people in the moment. I'm a little more deliberate than my competitors about where I, every step I take, the words that come out of my mouth, all that stuff. And, and I'm just a little bit more gritty. That's mm-hmm. the only thing, that's the only reason I, that's what, that's how I win races, man. Yeah. You know? I think that's the difference between people making it through buds and people not. It's, I get asked all the time, my, one of my least favorite questions, parents will come up to me, hey, can my kid be a SEAL? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. By looking at you and i look back when i went through and then as an instructor there's not some herculean difference it's not physical you can't look at a kid and be like you've got it because i've been wrong on almost every bet that i made as an instructor be like oh that kid's gonna crush it and ding 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 it's like mm-hmm. perhaps not mm-hmm. it's it's all between the ears and people look relatively the same it's just a little bit more grittiness a little bit more mental toughness a little bit more resilience or tolerance when it comes to pain yeah that's what gets people through at the end it's not some Oh, you know, some Adonis chiseled out of stone that shows up. I mean, there's those guys at Buds too, and sometimes they make it through and sometimes not. But yeah, it's the little stuff that makes the difference. Well, I've heard you say before, Andy, you know, the number one reason people quit is they start looking at that big picture, man. And, <laughs> oh, yes. And, and look, man, this this plays, this is, I've seen this play out time and time again, even going back to the mid state mile race when I was battling against Greg. You know, I told you I didn't think I could beat this dude. There was a distinct moment, though, that I knew victory was mine and he came to me in between one of the loops and he said chad we got six hours till we reach 100 miles i just smiled at him 
because it was like, it, it, I, <laughs> dude, hey, man, I thought you were going to win. You know, I didn't yep. tell him that, obviously, you know. And um, then you feasted on a small portion of his soul, and it drove you. Oh, 100%. <laughs> no, then, then I, then, so the loop after that, I knew he was checked out. So the yeah. loop after that, we're, we we get off of that loop, we come in, and I I tell everybody standing around, I'm like, hey, guys, did y'all hear about that race I did one time called Hell Week? It was like five days long, and we ran over 200 <laughs> miles with boats on it. And this dude's sitting over here listening to it, you know what I mean? And he and he's thinking, he's thinking, oh, my God. Yeah. This dude's going to freaking be able to run. What he doesn't realize is I'm hurting just as bad as he is. Yeah. That, that's the thing, man. I think that so many people think that their freaking pain, their depression, their freaking – uh, the, the, all the stuff they're feeling in life is unique to them. Yeah. They think that I'm immune to it. Negative, man. I hurt just as bad as you hurt. I feel the yep. same things you feel. I get depressed just like anybody else does. I go through highs, lows, peaks, valleys, the whole nine yards, bro. That's another misconception I think people have about the special operations community in general. But when people will ask me about you know, our old life of being a SEAL, they think it's people who are immune to those things, always having the best of a day, never depressed. Like, how can you guys go through that? You obviously, pain doesn't bother you. It's like, no, no, it bothers me just as much. Like, uh, currently in my life, I have a buddy here, you know, Montana, beautiful rivers and lakes. And I have a buddy who likes to go river rafting and he invites me all the time. I'm my like, number one. As soon as it starts coming out of his mouth, Hey man, do you want to go to the, I'm, no. He's like, why? I'm like, cause I hate the water. He's like, why do you hate the water? I'm like, Dude, your raft looks exactly like an IBS. Oh, it actually man. holds six people <laughs> with a fucking coxswain in the back. It's and, and I and don't cold water too. Yes, man. and I, I don't that. like getting cold, and I didn't like getting cold in buds, and I didn't like being covered in sand and chafing until I was bleeding from under my armpits and between my legs and a bald spot on my head, and like it's. But I did it. But it doesn't mean that we're immune to those things. That's and I wish. It's not that I wish. I hope people understand that, that there's nothing there's nothing special about me or anybody really, I would say, in that old job. We still feel those same things, yeah. and we have to work our way through those things and deal with them. I just try to be as honest as I can about it, mm -hmm. because I do know some people from our old job who want to put the Superman suit on and act as if bullets are bouncing off and that there is no, you know what I mean? Like, it's always, you know, let's frogman our way through this. It's like, uh... Or we could stop and deal with the bullshit and be a better mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. after it. Agreed, one hundred percent. Yeah, I th and then you know all those things that we experience. Pair that with isolation of the you know the year of twenty twenty. It's a bad recipe, man. Yeah, man. It, bad it, recipe. It, it really is, man. Now we. I mean, this was my first year of business, and twenty twenty was twenty twenty my first year of business, and and we actually uh, we've we've done really well, and we've brought people out of the woodworks. To uh, that, that want to come and be a part of an event, want to be a part. So I, I love, I love teaching. Mm -hmm. I love developing curriculum. Um, I love taking people out into the wilderness and teaching them. Just like you know, John Barklow. I yeah. remember John Barklow taking me out in Kodiak and showing me all these, all these how not to tasks. die. Yeah, yeah, how <laughs> not to die, man. So you know, we've we've developed curriculum similar to that, uh, and and we take groups out and and. Uh, we teach, man, and that's been a really great thing for us this year. So we haven't been as isolated as most have. Um, What's your business? So the business is called Three of Seven Project. Three stands for body, soul, and spirit. Seven is the biblical number for completion. Okay. So we, we look at all things body, your physical body, your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and then your spirit, which is your connection to a higher power, right? So we try to master, nourish, and maintain those three aspects to live a just a complete and wholesome lifestyle that's where the idea came from and it's really developing into a into a training pipeline because i got in 2020 man and even before that but especially this past year when all this crap happened dude i i got people think that these zoom calls are like the end all be all <laughs> that look man you can't learn but so much on a freaking zoom call man and, and and I got people 
I mean, people that are in this space of like they they want they want to be better, they self development. They think they can listen to a podcast or jump on a Zoom call. And, and and look, you know as well as I do, man. The only way that I can make a real impact in a person's life is to teach them these principles that you and I live in our lives. Teach them that, and then put them in an environment where they have to execute on those principles. And that's the step that people will miss, but. Listening to podcasts, great. Well, oh yeah, the Zoom calls, great. But there has to be there has to be follow on action action after it, or it's it probably won't have the impact that you might be looking. It for. It comes and goes, man. Yeah. I, I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen that in in uh, people yeah, on Instagram. I've I've been on Instagram for a freaking year, man. But but How are you liking that experience? It's crazy, dude. <laughs> it's crazy, man. <laughs> And, it's a necessary and evil for I, your I, business. I tell you, man, it's been good, though. Yeah. I mean, it's been good. And, and, you know, I see people, though, they come and they go. They come and they go. But, you know, the people that come out and, and participate in the events that me and I have a small team, my little brother and, and a, two two more dudes that uh, I, I really respect, um, they, they're my co-instructors. And they come out and do these experiences that we put on, and we see the real lasting impact. And... Um, you know, we teach we teach all kinds of stuff, but it's it's not like a beat down session, man. It's like really we're teaching you real skills and giving putting you in an environment where you can can execute those skills, mindset and practical, like yeah. you know, hands on skills. So that's what we're doing. And I have a podcast too that that's finally starting to make some money. All right, dude, you started a podcast. We're, we're back. <laughs> we're back. Tech issue that should be largely invisible to everybody. Except for the two of us in this room, I'm not going to tell anybody about my super secret uh, tech scabby sills and ability. Oh, he's good. I did one thing. The only thing I know how to do with tech. I actually I know how to do two things: unplug things and plug it back in, or turn it off and turn it back on. <laughs> Sometimes I'll pair those two, so I guess I have a third option. But boom, we're back and going. We're recording. You started a podcast. Sweet. Yeah, oh, and that was actually a good example of what it's like to start a <laughs> podcast. Because, yeah, we started with a, a little Yeti mic with a USB cable, and, you know, and it was like, you, and, and I think that's another thing, you know, it, this is a long game, man, this podcast is. And, and it's like, it's a learning game, too. It, it is. Like you just said, and a perfect example of I just happened to catch out of the corner of my eye. That doesn't look right. And, Previously, I'd probably been like, ah, it's probably fine. Yeah. So we'd talk for hours, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, hey, Chad. So we have a choice. We can try to pull the audio <laughs> off the video cameras, which is rough, or do you want to pretend like we didn't have that conversation and do it again? That'd be tough, man. <laughs> That'd be tough. <laughs> and, and that's with, with our podcast, you know, I've been, we've been doing it now for a little over a year, uh, the 3 of 7 podcast. And it's just now getting to the point where it's generating some income and it's actually reaching enough people that you feel like it's worth the time that you put into it because this yeah. is a huge time investment it's time investment and it is a learning curve that is steep you'll feel like you can level it off you're like all right i got it i got all my checks like i did before we started mm -hmm. and then you're like shit what just happened it's consistent learning curve and what i've been finding is you know efficiencies in the editing efficiencies in the recording system it's never ending and I don't want it to be. I don't like doing things that have a defined end state, like an arrival point where you're like, I'm done. Yeah. I, I hate stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's what I liked about our old job is that, I mean, I, I think there probably were people who had the headspace of, I'm good. I'm as good as I'm ever going to be. And those people were dangerous. I, I always had it in the back of my mind. If I ever feel like I know everything that I'm doing or I've arrived or I don't need to work hard or doing it like I got to get out of here because you're at your single most dangerous point ever agreed I thought I was good as an operator until I went to uh to be an instructor and that's that's the real it's interesting that, when you try to teach that was the real turning point for me man and that's why I think I'm so passionate about teaching I mean I'm good at it because I enjoy it but I think that was one of the things that that really showed it really identified my own personal deficits because, like you said, you can get to that point where you think, what else can I learn in another freaking ULT cycle? You know, Unit-level training for people yeah, listening. What, what else am I going to freaking learn? And then you go to trade it as, in, as a, I taught land warfare and then maritime operations, and um, it takes you to the next level as an operator. And I think that's what drives me to continue to teach now as a civilian is because it's really the natural progression 
to ever being becoming something that you I call it a master becoming the master of anything you know it's it's a the, the progression is you, you got to be the student right yeah. then you got to go out and you got to do the freaking job and then for you to you can do the job for a long long time but you're never going to master anything until you get to the point that you're teaching others how to do those things that you have been doing. Teaching is definitely part of mastery. It immediately gauges your depth of knowledge in any subject. And I tell you what, there is a disconnect between really high level operators and really high level teachers. Oftentimes they don't exist in the same person. Yes. And I would actually rather have the person that is a slightly less capable operator, but an amazing teacher than mm -hmm. somebody who is just a wizard behind the sights of their own gun, which is a time and place for that. But how do you generationally move a community forward if the only thing the person can do is just hammer home rounds on target? Because they're going to time out. I mean, I don't know if you could be a SEAL when you're 80. I mean, that would actually be sweet. Get wheeled around by new guys. I told you to push me over and just <laughs> mini gun on your wheelchair. So maybe that would be awesome. But at some point, you're going to time out. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed, brother. That's that's an interesting point, man. I, um, I've never, I haven't thought about that dynamic in a long time. Uh, of of which is better. I don't know um, if it's a necessarily a matter of better. I think one can move the community generationally mm -hmm, forward. Mm -hmm. Which, in the back of my mind, I guess to me, I always realized that I was renting my trident. You know, I earned the trident by going through the pipeline, but the seal community was not mine ever. And I think the best that I could ever hope to do would be leave it as good, definitely not worse, but hopefully a little bit better than I got into it. Mm -hmm. That's the way I viewed it from the first day to the last day and teaching people. And that's why when I went back as a BUDS instructor, I look at all the time I spent just under 17 years in. My most rewarding tour was when I was a BUDS instructor and I got to go back and actually teach people because you could see the impact that you are going to have on the future generations of the community. Yeah, yeah. And not everybody sees that because there were some guys there who were, they were just dicks. You know, they wanted to be there to beat their chest and it was about them as opposed to being about the students. And I remember sitting there one day like, these kids, which is what they were, which is what we all were mostly, except for the ones who weren't kids because they were in their 20s. I mean, we're talking post 9-11, volunteering for a career where you know you're going to get engaged in combat. Like, if you don't immediately have a level of respect for that, like, you're in the wrong spot, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you're going to end up working with these people. So if you don't want to get cold cocked in a bar, perhaps treat them as a human being. <laughs> True that, brother. True that. Yeah, it's been it's been an interesting journey for me, too, in the last year, man, kind of figuring out how how to, in a way, detach from that from part, the identity from that part of, of being my a life. Seal? Right, man. Um you know that that's been a it's been kind of a I, I don't know it, it, it's I guess it's been easier for me than most um, and, and I never want to I never want to uh, uh, I never want to lose that part of me right yeah but I definitely I definitely am realizing that I I am more than that man and I think teaching and doing what we do as business owners and, and that type of that's helped me a lot in that journey helped me become. Who, I, who I'm going to be now for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? How long have you been out? I got out uh, January 2019. So two years, basically. About two years, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I've been out for seven. And what I would say and what I've discovered or I think is going to be true for anybody who had our job or a job similar to it is that you will not be able to detach. That's That's something that I had to wrap my head around. Regardless of what it is, that you are able to do next in your life or whatever I'm able to do or attempt to do, mm -hmm. at some point in the telling of that tale, let me just tell you right now, the term Navy SEAL is gonna it's come, gonna up. come up. Yeah, it's going right. to come up. It's going to come up. And that's okay, as long as it's not what defines you. And it already sounds like it's not what defines you, but I had to come to grips with, regardless of how much I also want to move away. Because everything everything that I do, I try to I'm trying to again redefine myself. You know, I got out of the military, I was doing some flying stuff. Uh, did some military instruction on the free fall side of the house, some shooting instruction, the public speaking. I'm trying to move away from the SEAL community, meaning standing on my own two feet, not shunning them, but just trying to be able to stand alone on the outside exactly. of that. But you will not be able to, anytime you go publicly speak, it's 
trust me, somewhere in your bio, somewhere in your intro, it's going to say Navy SEAL. I have come to peace with that. And the only thing, the only reason I think I've been able to is that I try to do so many other things that are not directly tied to that. So that Trident, that $3 pin that you can buy at the exchange on almost any Navy base, doesn't become who I am. It's just what I did. And I'm super proud of that, but I want to do other things. That's so I can perfect. look so I can look back and say I also did this and this and this. And so I'm now no longer trying to like detach. I just accept the fact that that's going to be the case. Um and then I also feel like I feel there's a burden with that trident that we have to carry forward with us for the rest of our lives as well because most people will probably never meet somebody who was a seal. And if you're a dick or you're short with them or you're arrogant or you shut them down or you don't want to have a conversation with them, that's their touch point. You're right. So it's it's a burden, and but it also at the same time, it's an, an incredible honor. And I keep that in the back of my mind and then just try to focus on everything but that because I cannot control the fact that people will generally always talk about that. So go, go ahead and do that, but let's talk about the other stuff I do too. Yeah, and that's a perfect dynamic, Andy. And, you know, I think that's one of your biggest strong points, man, is, you know, I listen to you quite a bit and you like, you, you, you love to debate. You love to... to have the hard conversations but you you're very you're very strong at articulating things just like you articulated that dynamic between what we did and now who we can become yeah and how how they mesh together in a way and the um, danger is what you did becomes all that you ever were and i'm sure we both know i mean i know people who are stuck in that world and i feel sorry for them because again you will time out this you know nine eleven from nine eleven to twenty twenty one they'll probably the longest sustained period of combat in the history of the United States it's going to come to an end at some point point. and so the people who are in their thirties or forties now in the community thirty years from now nobody's going to give a shit about your stories you know you're right. and, and if you're, you're right. stuck in that world looking in the rearview mirror I mean do whatever you want with your life but wow there's so much more opportunity to mm -hmm. go and you know. You hear people talking about the dash. This is your birth date and the day that you die. There's so many other things you can fill it with. You're right, brother. <laughs> and you talk, you talk about people. Nobody's going to care about your stories, man. And so that's one thing that I've learned how to do is um, here's the thing. The stories are cool from, you know, being an operator, being in buds. The stories are there, right? But for me, I don't. When I go and talk to people, I don't really try to just sit around and tell those stories. What I've tried to do in my own mind is extract the valuable principles that were in the story, right, and then yeah. tell the story in a way that it highlights the valuable principles that you know that 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 story. You're possesses. educating, not entertaining. Exactly, man. Exactly, and that that's been really helpful for me. You know, there are only a few stories that I tell when we when we have a group come out and and we get to spend time together and, and we're at one of our one of our training events but those few stories are the ones that have the valuable you know the valuable i guess principles i couldn't woven agree more. into them you know i couldn't I mean? agree more i'll have i have had because 2020 was <clears throat> the year of no public speaking due to no people being in the same room together yeah <laughs> but i've had organizations reach out and they're pretty honest about what they want you know we, look, we want to have a keynote speaker at a dinner, and it's about 30 minutes. And could you just come and, you know, just tell some stories? And my answer is no. I've heard I've had the same request, man. I won't do it, and I don't care what the check they throw my direction is because – and I'll tell them, listen, I – the stories are valueless unless there is an educational component tied to it. My goal when I speak is I want to leave people – with very simple principles that can improve their life, whether it's how they view themselves and specifically leadership from that moment going forward. I'm not going to come in and talk about, so there I was, and then the bullets were flying over <laughs> but, my head. Because if, if you want that speaker, go find that speaker. Yeah. I am not that person. And like I said, I don't care what the check is. I'm not doing it. Same here, brother. Yeah. And, and, but that's what people think they want to hear. I can't tell you how many times I've been out with a, a corporate team or whatever, and somebody, that's what they ask is, Oh, was there ever a time that you just really thought it was over? Yeah, like, like right this moment, uh, yes, when you're asking me, I feel like I just need to leave. I'm like, dude, what do you want me to freaking say, dude? Like, come on, man. All right, the other thing I was confused about, is it stump or stumpf? You can feel it. I don't care. I've stopped. It's, it's stumpf with an F. Because when, when Steve Weatherford says that it's stump, yeah, but it's spelled stump, and he knows that. 
He just, I don't know, perhaps he has a reading disorder. I'm not even sure. Now, Steve's the best. My last name has haunted me my entire life. I had to ask, bro. Yeah. I'll respond to Andy Stump, and people will spell it S-T-U-M-P-H. I'm like, listen, it's not phone book. There's a F on the end of it, but it's not P-H like phone book. It's S-T-U-M-P-F. And like I said, I stopped caring a long time ago. There's like a, there's a soft F at the end. Stump F. <laughs> okay, right. I, I know now. And having I said that, now. I could care less. I'll, if, if it's some semblance of that, I'm like, yeah, here, like present. <laughs> Got you, brother. All right, sorry, I had to ask that. I said that was the other thing I was confused about. Yeah, man. So, uh, how's the podcast journey been for you guys? Are you and and I? Before you answer that, a, a word of caution to people who want to start a podcast because I get questions about this too. When people write to me and they say, "Hey, I want to start a podcast because." Either A, I want to be the next Joe Rogan, and we have to have a very serious talk about that. what that would take because there's Joe's numbers and then everybody else's numbers. Yeah. But two, they will pr approach me and say, you know, I want to do it, and they're looking only at the economic aspect of it. And I would say that is the wrong, that is an incorrect reason where I would push people away from wanting to start one because of that. Because it takes a long, it's an investment. I don't think I had somebody reach out to me for an ad for a year and a half. Yeah. And it grows over time and it <clears throat> requires an audience and nobody's going to listen in my opinion at least if you don't have something to actually talk about. If you're only doing it because you're looking at a dollar figure down the road, I mean do it again, do what you want, but whew, that's that's a long road to hoe. That 100% man. I mean the podcast it it's the thing in it's the aspect of my business that takes the most amount of time with the least probably financial with the reward. least financial reward. I mean, you think, man, you can go and do a speaking engagement and make thirty to forty thousand dollars in, an, in hour. an hour. And and guys, we're talking about these numbers sound crazy to you. I don't have a lot of money, okay? I don't I don't do, I don't go do a thirty thousand dollar speaking engagement every week. Old Chad here, old Chad here's worth about fifty, sixty thousand dollars. That's about <laughs> all I'm worth, all right? So don't get me wrong. I buy a lot of guns. So I make money, but I buy a lot of guns and optics and ammo and, and, and toys, right? So uh, don't don't think that I'm trying to be boastful here. But you know those, that's about the average for a speaking fee. Those things, you know, make make a make a lot of money and profit. And you know that podcast, man. I mean, I pour a lot of time and effort into that. The equipment's expensive, and um, your time's expensive. Yeah, your own personal yeah. value. I, I would say now, um, you know, it's the 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 most rewarding part to me is that, like I say, now it's reaching enough people that I feel like it's really, and that's my reward. The feedback it, you get from listeners? the feedback I get and, and see that people are listening to it and enjoying it. Um, and then as far as income, we have started uh, uh, the Patreon account, mm -hmm. which has been great, man. And we do special things for the, the that Patreon. It's Hopefully like, you have your clothes on for these special things oh yeah oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah oh well, no we we do a thing called resurrected it's bible-based content okay. that we that right. we provide for our uh patreon I just didn't know people. if we needed like a children's warning on this no, episode man. No. come see chad on patreon with but, no pants on <laughs> it ain't got that far yet brother we ain't that hard up yet um so the Patreon's been awesome, man because you know with the way that the way that the social media is becoming so censored um, you have to be careful. I mean, to be honest with you, if you want, uh, if you post on Instagram or something like that, you have to be conscious of what you say on there, or yep. it's just there's, it's just going to screw you all up. You know what I mean? And Evan Hafer told me one thing one time about posting on social media. He said it needs to either be informational, entertainment, or there was one other component. I, I'd have to think about it to remember it. But he gave me basically a guideline on what to post. But the Patreon is like a private social media network. Yeah, where these people can come, they do, they don't, they basically give twenty five dollars a month to support the show, and then you know we try to check in there with them. We make private posts. We have you know conversations on there that, and, and it's it's really not censored. That's what I love about it. It seems like there's no big heads, you know, limiting. You, yeah, I mean we get on there, man, and we talk about all kinds of you know um, stuff, faith and and uh, and and moral issues. Talk and about what you like. want to exactly man yeah. so that's been really re rewarding and it's 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 uh it's allowed us to generate to generate some income and i'm just so thankful that people there are people out there that 
enjoy the show enough that they'll actually give twenty five dollars a month of their hard earned money yeah to support us, man. I actually have one too, and I probably do I don't know if I've ever talked about it. I'm I'm probably the worst marketer or advertiser possible, but well, I do. Yeah, me too. On Mondays, I do an hour long Q and A. So the Patreon just gives people the access to that, and it's been crazy. They there's a community of people that have developed from. We do. We host it on Zoom, you know, so everybody can. That's what come we on. do. Yeah, and be interactive, yeah. and now they're communicating back and forth with each other and doing stuff completely outside of my involvement at all. But it's cool. I hop on on Mondays, ask questions. People have questions about the SEAL teams or exercise or you know what I mean, shooting or guns and mm-hmm. optics and whatever they want. And it's just another way to sit there. It's much more two way because they're literally asking the question. But for me, I tell you what, man, the coolest part has been the feedback that I get from the podcast. I have had uh, probably three or four emails now that have just rocked me and put me back on my heels. And it was people talking about they had intended to kill themselves and they changed their mind from listening to the podcast. And I don't even know how to, I don't know, how do you respond to that? It's um, other than thank you for making the choice to not take your own life. You know, I don't, I don't look at myself as a a master of anything or somebody who has incredible knowledge. I mean, I'm a moron trying to struggle my way through life, through the highs and lows, and I just try to be honest about them. But I mean, how, I mean, how much, what could you possibly ask for more than somebody to reach out and let you know that, you know, they're, they're alive at least for another day because something you talked about or said made an impact and it, and it changed their trajectory of their life. That's, I, I could give a shit about money i would take that over anything Agreed, else brother and yeah. that that really resonates with me man because we uh you know we i just had a guy not long ago he's actually uh a, pretty much a friend of mine <clears throat> that came out and hung out and you know participated in some training and uh he hit me up a few days after that and he said uh, and of course i you know keep his i'm not, I'm not gonna mention his name but yeah. you know he says you know, man, I've been thinking about taking my life for a long time, every day, for a long time. And he said, this this has changed everything. And I thought, holy crap, man. And, and see, my so my sea daddy, Jake Hubman, killed himself. Yeah. I, I was headed out. We, we Mine were, did, too, to be honest with you. It, did he really? Uh, one of the guys who was the most inspirational and who was uh, – I worked directly with him and for him in my first platoon, killed himself last year. I'm sorry to hear that, brother. Um, it was a rough one. It, yeah, it, that one put me on my ass. I mean, into a lot of, in a lot of ways, I still am. Like I'm doing my best to work my way through that, but fuck. Yeah, man. What a sobering uh, phone call that was when I got that, when I got that call. Yes, it. I, I'll never forget too with with Jake, man. You know that dude. Just like you said, Andy. I mean, he he taught me everything. And uh, he gave me tough love, but he was a he was a good leader. I remember one time we got done with a run out at Salk, um, and uh, I, I always carried a dub, even though I'm a little skinny white dude. They always stuck me with a dub because I could rock that freaking thing. Dude. Talking about an automatic weapon, yeah, probably a sixty or uh, that was a Mark forty six or forty six. Yeah. Yep. So uh, belt I, fed. We're belt talking fed. fun. <laughs> and we got done with a run, man, and you know I had to, I had the A dub propped up, and we were doing a, a little debrief right there, and um, I got a little lackadaisical because we were shooting blanks for yep. this run, and I, I didn't flip my safety selector back to safe, and Jake saw it, and you know he wasn't happy about it, and um, so I had to run for the rest of that week. I had to run from the barracks we were staying in to the range every day for a week in full kit in order to pay pay my dues well jake's the one that gave me that punishment but jake ran every one of those days with me because he took his job of developing me as a seal so seriously that that he actually felt that it was partly his responsibility that i made that mistake um and he was just a good dude, man. Yeah. And uh, how many yeah. times you leave it on fire after that? No, no, never. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. Some lessons burn deeper than others. Yeah. So in a way, when you get those emails, when you get those messages from, you never know the impact you're making, man. And, and half yeah. these people that half these men and women that, that are thinking about taking their lives seriously, you're not gonna know it. 
you don't know it until they they reach out to you and say hey this is where i was and and something that you said or did has has changed that trajectory and it's yeah. you know not saying that it's all me man but it, it does feel good i mean like you said how much what could what what better could you be doing with your time yeah if that's one person man one person you know that's enough for me but one person they impact so many others a hundred percent yeah the I, I worry less about people who can vocalize the struggles that they're going through i worry more about the people who just internalize I, it, you know, with with uh, with my buddy who t- took his life, I just, and I still struggle to understand what he must have been feeling that uh, he arrived at that was the answer. The amount of pain or frustration or anger at himself, what he was dealing with, and I, you know, I mean, what would you say to the guy if he was still here? If I knew it now, I'd be like, dude, you're not alone. Like. We all, you know what I mean? Because I, I think that feeling of being alone or isolated, again, I'm not an expert on suicide at all, but I, I feel like when you get to that place where you think you're the only one that's feeling like that, that yeah. option starts to look a lot more attractive than it should be. Yeah. Well, and two, man, uh, you know, another part of that story, you say, what would you say to somebody? You know, I can remember after Jake took his life, we came back, we were out at Mobility, and uh, we came back, and of course it was my job to clean his cage out. And I'm cleaning, I'm cleaning this cage out, inventory and gear. Uh, this gets me a little upset just telling this story, but um, I get to the bottom of his locker, and uh, I pull out like three, four Bibles, man. Mm-hmm. Like just like, and I'm like, man, you know, this dude was searching for something. You know, I didn't know back then. I I wouldn't known what to say to him, to yeah. be honest with you. You know, um, I I feel like I have a better grasp now of what i would say to him you know what i mean and and the the issue the issue is a man's heart and i don't know if you can understand that like the man uh, we we have to work on changing a person's like a, a true real and permanent change of a person's heart if you can get a person's heart his soul and his spirit, right? If you can get those things in alignment, everything else just falls into place. At least that's how it's worked with me, you know? And it's a tough one. It, man, the impact it has on the people that are left behind too is just yeah. hard to quantify. Yeah, that was a tough one. And that, that was in uh, October. It was, damn. Yeah. It, you know, yeah. It takes a while to process it. I, I still have it. Uh, it's still that's the, the. I mean, yeah. It's still hard to even even talk about those things and whatever. Yeah, I'm not the only one with that story, quite obviously. Yeah. Um, but what led you to the SEAL teams? We should start back at the beginning. <sighs> it sounds like you're from Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude. I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> There ain't a lot of old country boys from Georgia that make it through buds, brother. Uh, that doesn't surprise me, actually. But yeah, I we, mean, so yeah, what what was your path that got you there, bro? I was working in a concrete factory in North Georgia. I just graduated high school and went to work construction, basically. And uh, nothing wrong with that. You know, I grew up that, in a. That, const- that, my, yeah. my father was a mason. I, I work know. up on. Uh, grew up on job sites. It was actually phenomenal experience Mm -hmm. work ethic tenacity Mm -hmm. uh tolerance to pain (laughs) hey i love it man i mean the first thing i did when i got out of the seal teams was go and start a landscaping business just so i could get back to work right just get my hands back in the dirt man i'll never forget and then i'll tell you why i got in buds (laughs) i'll never forget when i started my landscaping business straight out of the seal teams uh, I was down in the dirt pulling weeds at a funeral home, and I'll never forget the funeral home owners like walking by me in their suits and ties, looking at me like I was a piece of freaking trash. And I wanted to be like, <laughs> I, I and it, I just smile because I'm like, I've literally stood outside the president, the the president of the United States bedroom where he was sleeping overseas. Per- in charge of protecting his life and just now because i'm down here pulling weeds you're beneath them yeah you you and now they didn't know my background yep you know it's just hey 
be careful how you treat people. What'd um, you call your landscaping business? I actually called it Frogman Landscaping. I thought it would be something, yeah, tried and cut and trim or some Fro- shit. Frogman <laughs> Landscaping. And, and of course, nobody, <laughs> nobody outside of Virginia Beach knows what a frogman is. Or San Diego. Or San Diego. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyways, I was, yeah, I was working a construction job right out of high school. And uh, man, I just came to this realization that if, uh, if I didn't get out of that small town that I grew up in, that that was going to be my lot in life. How small are we talking? I don't know the population. It was, I mean, it's, it's small, dude. Like, like one red light, um, you know, a couple thousand, people couple thousand nice. people probably. Yeah. I, I've never kept up with how many people live around there. Did you have any military service in your family? No, no. Okay. I had never even seen anyone in a uniform until I went to the recruiter's office. Okay. Le- legitimately, man. I mean, I had no clue. And so I'm thinking, what can I do to get out of here, uh, to get out of this? I just, what it wasn't fulfilling me, man. I just, for some reason, I just wanted more out of life. And, and I can, I think I attribute that mostly to my mother. Um, we were raised by really strong women in our family and they really developed us, uh, in a, in a great way. Um, so I remember I was on this laptop one time. What year is this? This would have been 2006. Okay. And it comes up, you know, back then they were recruiting really hard, man. I mean, you could get a steel contract. All you had to do is pass a PST one time. Yeah. Which is a physical screening test, which is... Not incredibly difficult. No, it's not. It's well. It took me about a dozen times to pass the dang thing. But, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm starting from scratch, right? I see this flyer says, you know, Navy SEAL training, uh, the hardest military training in the world. It was one of the flyer things, and it was almost just like a banner, an ad banner or something that I saw on a web page. Probably was an ad banner. It was okay, one of the early pop up ads. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. That, yeah, like, I remember that, him too. That's what it was. I'm like, hey, you guys need to do better intel collection because I'm in the navy and I'm still getting this ad. You guys need to knock <laughs> this shit off. Like, your your algorithm is not working incredibly well. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, brother. But I saw that, and something about it to me was um, uh, it resonated with me. Um, I liked. I've always been. I always like to go all in on whatever I do. Uh, I mean, even with hunting. Um, I get front sight focus on stuff, man, and that's just part of my my genetic makeup. I don't think it was something that was taught to me, or it's just how I am. If I'm gonna go do something, I wanna I wanna do the hard thing. Yeah. And so I went. Took me a while to pass the PST because I had never swam in a swimming pool uh, until I went to take the dang thing. So my wife taught me. My she was then my girlfriend taught me how to breaststroke. I learned I was not going to pass that PST with a, doing a breaststroke because it just smoked me. Yeah. I couldn't run because I was about 210, 220 pounds. No, you were not. I swear, dude, straight up. Pictures or it didn't happen? Oh, I, I, I've got some pictures. I've got stretch marks, <laughs> too. i got stretch marks in my armpits. And, and, All right. <laughs> and now, now I was, I was, this was muscle. I mean, I was squatting like 500 pounds. Like, yep. you know, I, I, was, I was getting a little help, too. You yep. know, I was, I was, you know, I was into weightlifting. Ch- chicken breast or chicken breast and yeah. a needle. Yep, I get it. <laughs> yeah, man. So finally I passed the PST, get a SEAL contract, and that's where my story uh, deviates a little bit from uh, from everybody else's. You know, I went into the Navy, get all the way through boot camp, and we're doing that freaking stupid thing at the end of boot camp. It's called like battle stations or something where they they have a, it's like a they have like a mock ship. They may not have did this when you went through boot camp, but it's like a a mock ship, and you go and you do this all night long thing. They're flooding these compartments and all, and then after that, you change your recruit ball cap out and you get your navy ball cap i do not remember doing that okay they may not have did it yeah. they, they've got a huge facility an indoor facility now yeah i went through in 96 oh yeah they yeah. didn't have that yeah. they didn't have that back then and so i'm um, we're going we just get done with this thing this final training exercise in navy boot camp and we're like walking to get our uh our Navy ball caps and the the RDC, which is like a drill instructor for Navy boot camp, he pulls me out and he's like, Chad, you have to go see the dive medical officer. They found something wrong with your um your dive physical. 
So I go up. They pull me out of formation. I freaking march over there to see this cat. And he's like, Chad, you have a seven centimeter pericardial cyst on your heart. And he says, this thing is not ever going to cause you any issues. It's the reason you didn't even know it was there. They found it on a chest Mm -hmm. x-ray. And he's like, but we're afraid that when you dive underwater or you go to altitude skydiving, essentially the pressure change would burst the cyst, which would be bad. And so he says, look, man, we're, we're not going to perform this surgery to take this thing off your heart. You can go to the fleet. Was it on the outside layer of your heart? Or it was, was it, the pericardium. So okay. the pericardial sac that your heart is actually contained in, Yeah, it was a pericardial cyst. So it was a, Interesting. on that pericardial. Okay. Yeah. It, there's a whole, the, the Navy wrote a whole medical journal on my case because I'm the first really naval special warfare candidate that they've ever seen this in which is the reason they didn't know how to deal with it um so he says hey man you you'll never be able to be a seal uh your contract's null and void you can go to the fleet and I'm like no man yeah how about um no yeah (laughs) but they made it a really a pain in the butt for me to get out I mean, they put me in this dang TPU, temporary holding unit. I'm sitting there twiddling my freaking thumbs for, seems like forever. It was probably like two months. Had my mom call our congressman and like just pull, trying to pull some strings to get me out of there. To get out of the Navy? Out of the Navy. Okay, so yeah. your choice, you basically were given, you can't be a SEAL, so you're like, I'm out then. I don't want it. Yeah. I don't yeah. blame you. Yeah, okay. That makes uh, sense. I, I did. I, that's not where I had set my goal, man. For sure. You know, and there's nothing wrong with being in a fleet. Like, that's a, that's an awesome career, man. People yeah. can make an awesome career out of that. Don't take it that way, guys. That's just this not where I had set my goal, personal goal. So I chose to get out, finally got out. I get back home to Atlanta. First thing, all my buddies, all my old redneck buddies that all knew I was going off to be a SEAL, right? They all laughed at me when I was leaving. <laughs> And boy, they all got a real good laugh when they saw me back a few months later. Cause they're, dude, everybody quit SEAL training. So of course that's the from a mathematical perspective, the odds were not in your favor. That's the first thing everybody thinks, man. Yeah. And here I am, dude. I'm, dude, I'm un, I'm still uneducated, man. I'm not like I say, I've never been the smartest, the fastest, the strongest, any of that. And um, you know, they're all like, oh, you know, of course, of course, Chad quit. And I'm actually, I'm over here like, no, I actually have this really rare cyst on my heart that just. I didn't even get a chance to quit. Yeah, I didn't even get a chance to even toe the line, man. <laughs> but of course, that's a, everybody that quits Buds has an injury or an excuse, right? So obviously, I've everybody thought I fit into that category. And I started trying to find a surgeon that would take this thing off my heart and uh, went to multiple surgeons and. I was a kid, you know, and these surgeons, heart surgeons would be like, first of all, none of them had ever operated on a pericardial cyst, mm-hmm. not a single one that I went to. So they were like, no, the the risk versus reward for this surgery is way out of whack. All right, we're not we're not doing this, right? Yeah. But finally, I found a surgeon named Dr. Cooper, and uh, he said, yeah, man, let's do this. Dr. Cooper was in the army. Uh, he's hard, dude. I, st- I follow him on Instagram. I mean, great, great guy. Uh, and I remember, dude, you know, it, that's and that's a big deal. I remember it's all fun and games until you're in the car riding to the daggone operating room voluntarily. G- this is a gamble. Because even if I had this thing removed and I survived the surgery and fully recovered, the Navy didn't say, oh, yeah, you can come back. Yeah. Heck no, the Navy cut me loose and said, we're never going to see Chad again. So this was a, a gamble, man. Um, And so I'm riding to the hospital. I look over at my dad, and I'm like, man, dude, they're about to split my chest open. Do you really think I should do this? And he's like, son, if you want to be a SEAL, you don't have any choice. And I was, roger that. And so laid out on the operating table. They removed this cyst from my heart. Uh, it took me quite a while to recover. Did they have to stop your heart to cut that thing off? I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to ask Dr. Cooper that. <sighs> Maybe he did. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'd want to cut stuff off around a beating heart. I'm going to be totally honest with you. I didn't ask any questions. I just said, hey, man, can you do this? He said, yeah, we're going to do it. And I said, roger that. What time? And Where do I need to be and what time? That's yeah. And one then you track. wake up and like, hey, how did it go? Good. See you later. 
<laughs> I remember, dude. I remember waking up, and uh, my grandmother was there. She was holding my hands, and I remember the first thing that popped. This is how bad I wanted it at that point. I remember waking up. The first thing I said was, I got my dreams back. It, dude, there was nothing was going to stop me from that point forward. Unless... The United States Navy got in your way. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, man. I can think of one thing that might get in the way of your dreams. I, if I, But I knew if I could at least get on the start line, I was going to be good to go. And so recovered and was back in the Navy less than a year after the surgery. So this all happened pretty quick. How was the process of getting back into the Navy? It was pretty tough, man. Uh, a lot of paperwork. Yeah. A lot of waiting. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of just unknown did they make you go through boot camp again no so i went back in because i had made it to the last day and made it through that last uh, evolution. final training yep. evolution they sent me back as a nav vet um so like a veteran navy veteran basically prior service guy huh. and uh, i sat in a holding cell i got all my paperwork from the surgeon the civilian doctor brought it and i'll never forget walking back into um, the dive medical officer. This because this was such a short span of time. The same dude was there. The same dive medical <laughs> officer. And I remember walking into those offices. He's like, "What the crap are you doing back here, man?" And of course, I had this packet of paperwork, and you know, I give it to him. And they take uh, they take like six months to. It goes like I think it went all the way up the chain, like yeah, all the way up to the top. And everybody wants to get eyes on it. And they wrote their little paper about it and all this. And they finally blessed me off. And What did you do for that six months? I was in that NAVET holding unit. And we just trained, man. We just worked. We went down to the, the little dive locker there at RTC. And they just beat us all day, you know, <laughs> every single day. Sounds man. about right. <laughs> yeah. That's all we did. Yeah. But it didn't matter to me at that point. I had so much invested in that. I mean, because I man, back home, we didn't have health insurance. Like this wasn't just like I didn't grow up with a bunch of money or nothing. This wasn't just easy to make this decision to do this. This was you know, I had to have help. Yeah. And uh but it was a blessing at the end of the day because everybody always asked me, if you would have went to if you'd have went to Bud's the first go around, and do you think you would have made it? The honest answer is no. Really? Really. I, I really I really don't think I really don't think that I was ready physically, to be honest with you. I think I think that my body was not durable enough. Hmm. So so I took it seriously that first time. Yeah. But I just wanted to get in, right? And I told you I'm coming from two hundred and twenty pounds, don't know how to swim, can barely run enough to pass a PST go to boot camp and if i would have went straight to buds i think something would have broke i I'm, this is just this is just my prediction i don't know you know I, I don't know but man that second go around after that heart surgery and then that six months of of uh of, tr of conditioning yeah holding time <laughs> yeah conditioning and, and i at that point i took it very very seriously you know what I mean? Because I just had so much invested, man. Yeah. And so breeze through bl buds. Um, what class were you? Two seven eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No issues, man. Uh, went straight through. Was never rolled. That's what's funny about me about some of these cats. Some of these cats that we talk about brag about. They've been through hell week four, three or four times. I'm like, well, that just means you're a turd. Yeah, it's not something that I would <laughs> want to intentionally do. It is. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess more power to you. Uh, yeah, I always, I always had an issue with rollbacks, man, in buds. Uh, not, not now. There, there were some cases where I think obviously it was a legitimate. This dude was a good. There were dude. some people who fell off an obstacle and then decided to relocate their femurs. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But man, by the time you got to third phase, and we're and you know more about buds than I do. You know more about what's going on behind the scenes. I was never there. You know, but the time I got to third phase, man, we had like 18 dudes that were original, mm -hmm. and I felt like it should have been us 18. I was like, why do these cats get a third, fourth, whatever chance? It, like, because the United States Navy was tasked with growing the force by 500 SEALs in a matter of about five years. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a that's a portion of well, it as well. I, I, I mean, 
in a way, I feel like it degrades the the, the final product. But it can. In some cases now, Andy, I'm not saying yeah. everybody. I'm saying there's some legitimate cases. But It was interesting as an instructor to give you a peek behind the curtain. You know, you get a performance role and you get a medical role. Those are the two things that you're, you're essentially guaranteed you're going to get. Um, you know, if you fail the four-mile swims in first phase, they will retread you to retrain you, but you're not going to get a second one. Um, but there were, you know, and that exists to allow people who might need a little bit more training, uh, fill in the blank, or recovery time, you know. But there is bureaucracy involved behind the scenes. You know, there there are questions about percentage of throughput, you mm-hmm. know percentage of the class that's you know why is x number of people not passing the dive physics test you guys must be doing a shitty job as instructors it's like no maybe it's a combination of the instructors and the people that we're actually working with there was an emphasis on getting people through and i don't say that in a negative manner but it i mean it's they they wanted to grow the force and they still do yeah yeah and if they modify the standards that's where the problems start creeping in in my opinion. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, and I don't think the standards were being modified. I just think if you go through the pipeline that is SEAL training all in one shot, I mean, that that speaks volumes for the individual that does that. There's luck involved, though, too. And, that, I, will, and I will tell you that from being an instructor, there were some injuries of guys that was completely out of their control. A hundred percent. Now, in those cases, my comment is null and void. All right? Yep. But I, talk, I talked about that de- being deliberate, being deliberate about right every step you take, being deliberate about the, every obstacle you go over. Like, and that patience, it takes patience in order to be deliberate. I mean, you know, those are the, those are the type of things that it takes to get through a pipeline like that all in one shot or to, or to run a 100-mile race, Yeah, really. You know what I mean? So if you go and you run a 100-miler, that is a testament to, to the fact that you are patient, that you can stay present with your task, you can be deliberate about everything that you do, say and do, and um, yeah, I don't know, I don't even know why we're talking about this. I've just always, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a, it, that's my story, man. Made yeah. it, made it, made it through buds, got to the SEAL team. Where, um, uh, you were an East Coast guy because yeah. you mentioned Virginia Beach. Yeah, I was East Coast, so also known as the JV SEAL teams, but it's fine. I mean, obviously the West Coast teams are superior. <laughs> Every yeah. way, they're better operators, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking for people hey. listening, screaming at their radio. <laughs> um, what team did you start at? SEAL Team 8. Cool. Yeah, and um, did a couple rotations there, went over to Trade It, uh, did my deal at Trade It for a couple years, and then I was medically retired in January 2019, which um, – that was one heck of a freaking process, man. What um, uh, what led to the medical retirement? At TBI, man. Uh, you know, I, I got to a point. You know, and and here's the thing, man. They can ve- they 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 can't really identify this. The lines between TBI and PTSD are so blurred. I think there's 13 symptoms, and they share 11 of them. Okay. It gets. I mean, it's you're even so the, dang smart. Even man. the well, I went through the same process, yeah. and I had somebody who was smart explain it to me because trust me, I am not. But it, it, it gets difficult even in the diagnosis because you know, like apathy, short temper, is that post traumatic stress or is that TBI? Is it both? It's it. They both exist. Which one is it? Yeah. The reality is, I think they know. What was what did I hear one time? They know more about the surface of the moon. Than the actual inner functionings of the brain. Wow, <laughs> I believe it, man. Yeah, I believe it because that's when uh, going through that process. That was a very stressful process to me. I don't know, man. Maybe it's different for everybody, but did I had, you want to initiate it, or did the military initiate it for you? The well, they didn't give me a choice. I went to the doctor because here's what was happening. I would be out at night on nods, and um, I would lose my balance, and I would just like hmm. fall over. And so what what had happened was my vestibular system, which is in your inner ear, on the left side, it was like completely destroyed. They gave they get put me through this whole dang test thing and they gave me a percentage of the, you know, how well it was functioning on Mm -hmm. each side. And I didn't know that at the time. So like I'd be out on nods and I would like squat down to take a knee 
while we stopped the patrol, and I would just lose my balance and fall over. And I was like, "That's got to be rough." Yeah, I was like, "This is this is getting kind of dangerous." for me like as and for my team yeah you know what i mean so that's when i went and told them about that and then dude they just start sending me down this freaking rabbit hole dude and they're sending me to these dang doctors like every day and and like they pull me pull me back out of the out of the mix and just like for my full-time job seemed like it was going to these doctors and i had never went to the doctor like my whole navy career you know it was like I didn't have it yet. My medical record was about three pages long. Same. Um, so, so was that a damage to the vestibular system? I'm assuming there was a close proximity to a blast of some kind. Well, I was a breacher, so well, that'll do it. Yeah, we had I had quite self-induced a, blasts. Quite a few close proximity <laughs> of blasts, and you know, we always you always try as a breacher to get minimum safe distance, but emphasis on the word try. Yeah, it depends situation. It, yeah. it, this, it depends and. You know, I guess that's what it was. And I know the blast affects different individuals, affects their brains differently. So there could be another dude that's a breacher that's exposed to even more than I was exposed to, but his brain just takes it better. And apparently mine didn't take it too well. <clears throat> and it was, yeah, it was throwing me off. Even my thought processes and, and just, I just didn't feel right. You know what I yeah, mean? Didn't feel like yourself? Didn't feel like myself, man. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's really difficult to explain they sent me through NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, up yeah. at Walter Reed, and taking these battery of tests, and they're like, hey, you're doing fine. I'm like, I understand that the result of this test shows you that, but I don't feel like the person that I used to be. Like, there is a disconnect in yeah. the firing of my brain. And they're like, well, based off of the objective analysis of this test, it looks like everything's okay. I'm like, all right, I guess I don't know how to explain to you that, the, you know, because I didn't have a test from before. That That's the problem. That would have been awesome yeah. if I would have had a test when I came in and then a test when I get out. I could be like, see, this is the difference. I have no other way to explain to you that my brain is not functioning the same way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and Maybe they'll start doing that for guys. That would actually be— Well, they're making guys now wear, wear sensors on their kit. Well, I mean even just cognitive testing on the way in. Let's I get think a, they are doing that, that would, now. It's awesome. Yeah. Otherwise, what reference do you have? Because they can sure. image your brain and be like, look at all these— I forget if it's dark or white spots because I was not eligible for the MRI. But they'll look like, oh, this is damage, damage, damage. It's like, okay, but when was this and where did that come from? They're like, oh, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. We can like, okay, so it could have been Pop Warner or sucking up a six foot strip charge on a door. Which mm -hmm. one of these caused it? And like, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, no, they don't, man. They don't, and they do that instead of sending the people to NICO to save money. Now, now they still do send people to NICO, but they've they've stood up a basically a local program called the Warrior Concussion Clinic, and it's ran locally. So you know you're going home every evening, and I almost wish I just would have went to NICO because that whole process, man, gosh, it stressed me out. I do not like going to doctors and telling them things that are wrong with me. Yeah, it bothers me really bad. And I've never told this story before, man, but it was stressing me out so bad toward the end of it. This sounds crazy, guys. <laughs> this sounds... Uh, look, I'm talking about being stressed about going to a freaking doctor every day. And, you know, a year earlier, we were jumping out of a freaking C-17 at 14,000 feet over the Atlantic Ocean. Like, that kind of stuff is easy for me. This crap, for some reason, was hard for me. And like I'm standing there, my I'm just maxed out with all these doctors been hitting me with all these questions and tests and crap all day, telling me, oh, this might be wrong with this, dude. And I'm having a conversation with my wife, and next thing I know, I'm pissing in a trash can, in my freaking kitchen. I like like my mind had left my body. At least it wasn't on the floor. At least it was a <laughs> trash can. And 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 when I my wife looks at me and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, holy crap. All right, man, I got to change. Like, this is maxing me out, man. <laughs> this sounds crazy, dude. But so, anyways, that's how that's how tough that transitional period was for me. And you feel like, too, man, you feel like you're – you almost feel like you're blackballed from the team, too, man, from the guys that you've been working with. Because, you know, you walk into the office and, you know, you've been out doing these freaking doctor's appointments and bull crap for – the last three weeks and they've been working yeah and you walk in there and they're like dude where you been you know what's what freaking what's what's special about you you know and i'm like i'm just doing what i'm told man yeah um yeah it is tough it uh 
The SEAL teams are an interesting beast. They can make you feel as if you're absolutely essential. But then you come to the realization, once you move on, so do they. Oh, 100%. 100%, man. Yeah. We have – how could you want to leave, quitter? We need you to be here. And they're like, ah, whatever that guy's gone. Hey, come here, new guy. And that's it. They won't, and that, and that, I'm fine with that. That's the mechanism. That's the way it has to be. The machine has to keep moving on. But it will trap people if you don't realize you need to keep your head up a little bit and think about your own personal future. Yeah. Otherwise, you can get behind the eight ball. I know a lot of guys who have been at the 18, 19-year mark, they're like, yeah, I'm going to start on my, on my education. I'm like, ooh, you could have started that early. You could have mm-hmm. been done with it. I mean, you know, the time to start your bachelor's is not when you're at your 19th year in the military. I'm, I'm not saying it should prohibit people from doing that, but a little foresight, you could have been done at your 19th year. Yeah, yeah. So, no, 100%, brother. Did hey, you deploy uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan, or where did your deployments no, take we, you? we so basically when we got to SEAL Team 8 in, I guess it would have been 09-ish. Okay. They were coming off of their last Iraq deployment, and then we took over the whole continent of Africa. So all my de- deployments were AFRICOM, and we were all over that continent, man. What were they having and, you do? You know, we were. It was some of it was was FID, um, foreign internal defense, yeah, t- training partner forces largely. Um, some of it was working with uh, other. Um, three-letter agencies, you know, providing security for them uh, yeah. when they would go out and meet with contacts. Uh, we, uh, I got to play QRF for the uh, embassy in Tunis, Tunisia. Uh, it got hit simultaneously with the t- embassy in Benghazi. Uh, boy, they freaking, <laughs> they did some work on that. When we got there, dude, they had burned like 300 up-armored SUVs in the embassy lot. They had smashed Ooh. out all the freaking windows, took the flag, um, it was a mess. So Sounds that, like it. that was a fun mission. Um, guys were all over the place. I mean, and we would deploy, we would deploy in four month deployments and we would deploy in very small teams. Like when we went into Tunis for that mission, we had, I guess we had four guys and we met with a, it was called a SIF team from the army, mm-hmm. Green Berets. We linked up with them. It was cool though, man. We like flew in and a, I don't. I, I don't want to get. I. I feel uncomfortable telling about too much of this stuff. But Just go as broad as you want, man. Yeah, I mean, you flew in in an airplane. Yeah, we flew in in an unmarked <laughs> aircraft, and they like pay the little dude off, and we get out MP fives and backpacks, and you know, concealed MP fives. Uh, Interesting. Going with a pistol caliber round. I well, like where your head's at. We and we we so we had we had our we had all of our you know primary weapons and and you know combat equipment and yep. body armor and stuff but we actually once we got into the embassy we we set up our ready room and you know had all that stuff staged there but um that was a fun mission so it was it was a different career for me my career as a seal was i think very atypical from uh from what most people were experiencing during the years that I was in and in a way, I've always resented that. I, I felt. I don't think that's uncommon. I, I felt like, um, to be honest with you, man, I, I had a lot of anger. I had a lot of anger about that. Not that what we were, what we were doing was, it was fun, and we were making an impact. We were making a difference, but you know, we weren't freaking. It, it, we weren't setting up sniper hides and freaking killing dudes every night, and that's what everybody wants to do. Right, but it's and that's luck- what everybody thinks they're going to be doing. Freaking luck of the draw, man. Yes, luck expectation management is a huge thing, and, and I, I'm over that now, man. Because what I what I've realized is the stuff, the stuff that that the missions that we did get were they were valuable, and they were valuable from a from a lessons learned standpoint. They were valuable to our country. Um, the work we were doing, I think, was valid and it was needed. And uh, it took me some time to reconcile with that, man. I can totally understand that. Um, You know, my career was either lucky or unlucky, depending on the optic that you view it from. Because if you get yourself into those more DA or direct action centric roles, you know, the knife cuts both ways. I ended up on the wrong side, uh, you know, of an enemy gun and on the same time, you know, had plenty of opportunity for other people to end up on the wrong side of my gun. But 
perhaps this will uh, help you put it behind you as well, too, because I get asked this question. I actually got I answered this question. I do Friday episodes where it's just uh, Q&A. And the guy was asking about, you know, the older generation of special operations and who's better or how do you, you know, what's the metric? And in the modern day, oftentimes I see a mistake of using combat as the metric of whether or not you were a good SEAL. The people who put me through training were in that dead zone, if you will, from post-Vietnam to pre-9-11. They saw none. And I could not hold them uh, on a higher pedestal. I yeah. still look up to them. So what is that? I mean, so I happened to come in in a time period where I got to see combat, but it's irrelevant and it shouldn't be the only metric because those guys who put me through were amazing and then the SEAL teams are going to cycle through. You just can't use that. I mean, let's be honest. A lot, of, a lot of guys use the metric of how many people they've killed as whether or not they're a good team guy or they've been successful, right? They have to cross some threshold. Who cares? Because I'll take the guy who has no combat but has the ability, who is trained for a decade and understands TTPs, those tactics, techniques, and procedures at a deep level and can teach and can mentor and can lead. I'll take that guy with no combat experience over the dude who's done... 10 years of combat experience, but he's a functioning alcoholic and he's on his third yeah, man. third marriage, no relationship with his kids, he's in debt, he's in risk of losing his security clearance. Like that's not a that's not a good seal. That's a ticking time bomb. Yeah. So don't worry about the combat experience. It's it's not the metric that should be used because if it was and it's the only one that matters, well then we have to throw away three generations of seals that existed post Vietnam pre 9/11. You know, and once I came to grips with that, I was like, oh, okay, this this shit's not that important. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's I'm going to do my job, and it's part of the execution of that job. But again, I look back at my career, which was average at best, and the thing that I feel the most proud of is my time at Buds. There's no combat there. I mean, there's psychological combat with the students, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Andy, and, and that's the it thing. It helps frame it for me, though, because you can be like, you know what? Oh, okay. It, it 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 re it's a different optic to view it from and you'll realize like you know what it doesn't matter how many combat missions you've been on it, that's not what is important it what's important is whether you left the community in a better place than when you went into it yeah and if i if i personally you know look back on on my life for the last <clears throat> whatever it's been now 12 13 14 years <clears throat> what were the most valuable portions of that career and even up to this point now the most valuable portions for me were definitely the initial training pipeline, really forging me and 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 teaching me a lot of principles that people It's a crucible. Don't. It's it's that crucible. The time that I spent as an operator, yeah, man, there was we we like I say we did a lot of we did a lot of good work. We did a lot of fun stuff, but it, to me that wasn't all all of the value that I pass along now to our students it's not really coming from stories in that block right there's some, i feel like i feel like what i did in that block was be a terrible person <laughs> I, I really do okay i, I mean I, I really do i mean i i just dude when i got to the seal team man you know i i was not a good person um and freaking all I, you know, I the, the, I just remember freaking drinking and partying and sleeping with women and and living it up and acting like a freaking idiot. Yeah, that's a lot of what I did during that during that block. Up as in, as do many. Yeah, you, you know, and and gosh, man, even even when we were overseas, man, some crazy crap, just acting like an idiot, man. And uh, I guess there's lessons there too. I guess I just haven't delved into them yet but i got saved man during that block and i guess that's the one big thing uh the the biggest thing valuable thing that i can pull out of that big chunk of my life was getting saved and um i mean maybe it wouldn't have happened if you weren't doing those other things you know sometimes yeah yeah sometimes you need that stark contrast between you know before and after oh it definitely i mean we were staying in this freaking building on deployment man and uh there's dude there was a daggone there was a demon in this thing man <laughs> i'm not kidding you i'm not kidding you man this freaking thing whatever it was i had no connection to god 
at all. And we were living in this place, me and four other guys. And one of the dudes that were there, he, he was a Christian and he starts reading his Bible. And it, I, dude, I'm not kidding you. It aggravated this freaking evil thing that was this evil presence in this place what kind of shit was going on i'm here? not kidding you man we're talking about like uh cups being I'm knocked ta- off i'm like- talking about dude i was laying in bed one night first of all first of all when this first started happening i was laying in bed one night and i heard something hit my door and it what it jolted me awake and then i heard like singing like almost like singing or voices up and down the hallways of this building we were living in and I was like, what in the crap? I knew it was just us. We, our rooms were adjacent, ad- adjacent, me and one dude, and then the other dudes were across the hallway. And I knew there was nobody else in there. So I get up. I look out in the freaking hallway. There's nothing there. And I'm like, well, that was freaking weird. But it kind of shook me. You know what I mean? And I so I get back in bed. And then the other guys that were there started freaking having similar crap like bumps in the night like just and and two just a feeling of oppression man like it was (laughs) affecting our relationships between one another like when i would when 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 i'd walk in this daggone place we were staying in it had a stairwell and i would go to walk up the stairwell and i would feel something watching me like bearing down on me to the point that i would have to look back up to the landing to to see what it was like it was that freaking real and these other dudes are like yeah man this this uh, i feel it uh, man this is weird to the point that uh, after about a week and a half we're all sleeping in the same room together <laughs> like we moved our freaking crap into the same room together okay and so uh i called my little brother and i knew that that he uh was a christian and i said man I don't know where else to turn, but uh, while all this was going on too, we we started telling the 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 support people there that were working. We were like, "Yeah, man, this freaking weird crap's happening in this barracks over here, man." And they were like, "Oh yeah, well, Senior Chief So and So was staying in that same place by himself two weeks ago, and he was telling us that some weird crap was happening too." So I mean, look, man, y'all could take this for what it is. I got nothing to sell you. I'm just telling you what freaking happened, man. <laughs> I call my brother, man. I'm like, dude, <laughs> we got to do. It. Look, I know you've got some sort of uh, understanding of this spiritual stuff. Can you give me some advice here? So he put me in touch with his pastor back home, and his pastor called me overseas. I had a little Vodafone, you know, yep. and I put him on speakerphone, and he's like, all right. I waited till everybody else leaves so they wouldn't think I was crazy, and he he <laughs> prayed over this place, dude, that we were staying in, and when he did that. Like, total peace returned to that place. And peace, like, um, just tranquility, even even amongst us, each other, in our relationships as teammates. And after that, I was like, all right, th- there's some power here, right? And so that's when I, I start, that's basically when I decided to uh, look into exactly what, the Bible says about what God is and what Jesus is. And that totally changed the whole trajectory of my life. Did it change what you thought of the SEAL teams or your occupation when you started having that exploration into, I'll just call it uh, religion or spirituality? Not at all. Not at all. Because you know what I do, man? I ain't been to church. I don't go to church unless I go to speak at a church. And, and personally, I'm not a, uh, I wouldn't consider myself to be a religious person. And watching religion from afar, there's a difference between going to church and being religious. Oh, yeah. Wait. And then again, I don't engage in that world, but I can see that it's like, just because you go there, I don't necessarily think it might mean that you're uh, living up to what they're talking oh, about. Oh, we screwed it all up. <laughs> we, it's, it's a freaking clown show, dude. So, I mean, I started... I literally gave my life to Jesus. Some of you guys, that sounds like religious talk, but in a real way, that, that that's the awesome thing. I started, I got me a Bible, and I started looking at this thing and seeing, oh man, okay, this makes this makes sense to me. This is this is what, um, you know, this is how this stuff works. This is, and, and the message of the gospel 
uh, the message of, of God, first of all, it's, it's interesting to me that nobody's even debating this question of, of whether we were created by a sentient being that is far out of our element, right? Mm-hmm. Or this all, ha- or, or evolution, basically this all happened because of uh, whatever freaking random circumstance. Nobody's debating that anymore. Like, why don't we debate that? Because I think people still talk it, about it. it. Maybe people talk about it, but but look, dude, if if you really debate that, you see, you see that even science. And here's the thing: being an atheist, or being or or, or believing in God, not even saying believing in Jesus, but believing in a creator. Neither one of those are a science, right? Those are just beliefs. But the science, the science actually leans heavily toward creation it's it was logical to me when i read the story of creation in the bible it made sense to me it it just did mm-hmm. it still does and maybe it's because i have a simple mind I don't, I don't know the bible's written at about a fifth grade level it made sense to me the order right um and, and yeah it, it, it's like that makes so much sense to me. It's so easy for me to understand it. Even the fact that we were say say there say there's a being that did create us. Why did they create us? Why why did a God create us? If you can believe that, if you can believe we were created, why? Why? It's simple to me. Why? I would say that board that guy was probably very bored and wanted to watch just a total shit show. Why do we have dogs? <laughs> why why do we have dogs to eat scraps? We, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some people, because we want companionship, right? Yeah, we were we were the the Bible again says we were created in the likeness and image of our Creator, so we we enjoy that companionship with something lesser than us, but that will love us unconditionally. In my mind, that makes sense. Why, if there was a God somewhere in, um, not even in the universe, but outside of the universe. Why would he create us? Because if we're created in the likeness and image of him, that tells me that he would want companionship with something the same way that we do. And essentially, I believe that's the way, that's the reason that he did create us. The, 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 fact, of, the fact of whether you believe in creation or evolution, to me, that's an easy one, man. Because like I say, the science points so heavily toward creation. And the theory of evolution has been disproven Time and time and time a freaking again, man. I think that one depends on who you talk to. But, I mean, so for my, myself, I would say, I would describe myself as an agnostic. I have no idea either way. Yeah. Um, and so I can understand evolution, but let's say you trace evolution all the way back to the beginning. Well, what kicked off the beginning? Yeah. You know, so they, there's a connection there on either one of those sides. And I just don't know. Well, see, I can't even understand evolution. Because here, I can understand adaptation, mm-hmm. and I can understand mutation, but I cannot understand evolution. A dog, we have all different types of dogs. Small ones, big ones, wolves, coyotes. I mean, obviously the best right? best ones are mini Dotsons. Yeah, mini Dotsons. They hunt, I mean, they're bred to hunt bears. And lions. There you go, brother. I'm down I, with that. I saw some lions. Just saw, so you know, though, that's not true. So don't buy a pack of mini Dotsons for them to. <laughs> I saw some. I saw some lion tracks today. Yeah. Um. But a dog is is always going to make a dog. I, I can't understand, nor have I ever seen an example of something turning into something completely different. Well, you never will because we don't live long enough. I mean, the optic of you and I, we're. we're fucking blink of an eye and you know what i mean in the overall totality of time would there not be evidence in the ground uh i mean i think there is probably evidence of the uh and again i don't know the correct term because right now we're so far outside of my uh wheelhouse when it comes to knowledge and understanding i'm not a scientist either by yeah the that's way. what i'm saying like yeah. so i mean we i mean everything that i'm saying is my opinion i am not a scholar or, or even educated on this topic really but i think you can see the adaptation or mutation or evolution um, you can see that historically through, in my understanding at least, uh, different species of animal as time goes on. For example, whales having hip bones, as if they used to, or that species used to, uh, walk on land. You know what that means to me? The, the, the fact, 
You know how a whale's flipper, if you pull back the skin, it looks like a human arm and hand? Or like you said, a, a hip bone or yep. something. You know, the, the design, the, the, that, that points to me that they were made by the same creator. They were designed by, you, you see a similar design throughout multiple species of animals. That, that to me doesn't say, well, that means that we have evolved and that and that's the reason that these species have similar characteristics. That to me tells me that they were designed by the same creator. Yeah, using and I think the same other, logic of yeah. design. And again, I'm not the authority on this. I think other people would say that to them that is an example of a, a changing environment that they were living living in and a forced adaptation or mutation. And I don't know what which it, the hell of those is correct. It don't make sense to me. But but I, I try I try to always keep things simple and go yeah. with what's logical in my mind. And here's the thing. You and I could completely disagree or we could get six people in here and a devout person who is creationist. Uh, I don't even know what the other options would be in this conversation, but it's like, cool. All of you believe whatever you want to. Like we can all believe what we want to believe and, you know, live the best life yeah. that we can. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think, I think that I should probably be more well versed on the evidence pointing to creation if we're gonna have if we're gonna have this conversation. But I, and like that's I said, my bad. You I, know I'm what I mean? so far out of my wheelhouse on but, this topic. And again, because of that, that's where I say I, I land in the middle. I'm a, I'm agnostic. I have no idea. Yeah, and and ultimately, man, you know, when when I got when when you when you understand the Bible, then then you have to ask. Well, why Jesus? It is absolutely heinous that I follow a Jewish man that died on a cross 2,020 years ago. That's heinous. That's foolishness. You have to answer that question then. So, so for me, believing that we were created is the easy part. That's the easy part. The hard part is saying, why this guy named Jesus, because all of a sudden, now if you read the Bible, which is the best-selling book in the history of the world, still to this day, um, he is the cornerstone of it all. So, in other words, if you just believe in God, sorry, bud, that ain't going to do you no good. All of a sudden, Jesus becomes the cornerstone. And that was the hard question for me. In, in my walk, you know, and I, I had to figure out why. Hard question Jesus. being why why you would follow uh, the things that he said. No, why why do I think? Why do I think? So so essentially, we we he he died on a cross, right? He was he was literally God in flesh. He came down onto the earth, lived a was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, was crucified on a cross was laid in a tomb, and then he rose out of the tomb on the third day and ascended ascended back into heaven. That's freaking crazy, man, to believe that. But you have to believe that because— I mean, that's why they call it faith, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it, I think there are aspects of it that, that you can look at that, that can help you in that, right? Because we can't believe— you can't believe that that happened. And, and so the, the reason that you have to believe that is because that was the atonement for our unrighteousness, right? Because obviously, if we believe in a creator, we believe that the creator was perfect. In other words, the creator of all of this, he cannot tolerate unrighteousness. And so we had to have an atonement, right? Because sin entered mankind, and Jesus was our lamb, basically. He was our sacrifice. And if you don't believe in the atonement of his blood that he shed on the cross, and you don't believe that he rose again, giving you victory over death, hell, and the grave, that's what matters. That's the yeah. message of the gospel, right? That's it. That's all, that is what you have to believe in order to be right with your creator. That's hard, man. Was that atonement supposed to be for all time, or are things that had happened up until that point? Because there's some shit going on in the world that is a little wild. Uh, now, <laughs> what, what do you, you mean currently? No, I mean, you know, so it, again, not a biblical scholar, but you're talking about, you know, dying for mankind, the atonement for the, the sins of man up until that point, 
or was that atonement symbolizing into the future as well? You know what I mean? You understand what I'm asking? Yeah. No. Yeah. It's it's for it's for all time. Okay. That, yeah. That was yeah. my question. That, that atonement symbolizes is, all time. is for all time yeah. and 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 for throughout all of mankind. And you know, a lot of people ask, well, what about the what about all the people before Jesus? You know, what about all the people that that lived on the earth before Jesus died on the cross, man? And you know, I think that those. I think there are places in the scripture that answer that answers that question and it talks about how those individuals prior to Jesus that didn't have that didn't know God that didn't know the creator some freaking civilization living out whatever native americans for instance um those people will be judged by their creator but they will be judged based off of morality right just the type of people they were, mm -hmm. right? Well, we don't have that excuse anymore because we have access to that atonement. They didn't have a choice, right? And you look at morality in and of itself. How do you even explain morality? What what is it's a tough it? one because it shifts by person? Yeah, it, why or by do, region? You know, what I mean, it's it's tough. That's a tough one. Why does it even exist? Where did it freaking come from? So we can feel guilty, I think. So we can. <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. So you can shame others. No, trust me. It's uh, you know I, <clears throat> I think I've talked about this before, but so I've never I would never have, I have never considered myself to be a religious or a faithful person. But I'm very envious of people who are able to live their life that way. It for me it is it's a bridge. So the story that you, not the story, but where you're talking about the, the death, all of that, the rising from the dead. For me, personally. It's a bridge too far to believe. Um, it's foolishness. And But here's the thing. I see people who are incredibly religious. I see the positive impact that it has on their life. And I think that's it's amazing. And they'll say, well, all you have to do is is believe. And the problem is, is I can't force myself to believe. No, you can't. And and that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't know. I try to live my life the absolute best that I can. And if I'm wrong, well, guess what? That's on me. But I also am not going to try to fake it. It's just been something mm -hmm. that I've never been able to... I guess find my true north on, which mm -hmm. is why I said, you know, I land in the middle on it. See, I couldn't believe either. And uh, even though I'd had that experience that led me to finally open this book, I couldn't believe either. And, but I knew that this book made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And the, and, and I knew that, that I wasn't a good person. I just, my heart wasn't right. I wasn't a good person. I wasn't perfect by any means. I knew that. And I understood that if there was a creator, he was perfect because he created something that's magnificent and perfect. Literally, this creation is perfect. We're, we're ruining it right now as humans, but... I generally ruin any environment I go into. <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect creation, though. If anything, <laughs> and then I show up and people are like, God damn it! <laughs> if anything was a little bit off, it wouldn't work, you know? And, and so I couldn't believe either. So what I, what I had to do is I had to literally humble myself to the point I wanted to believe really bad because, like I said, I saw that there was power there. I saw the impact then that it was making in my little brother's life and, and the changes that he had made and, and how he was experiencing the fullness of life. And I wanted that, man. And I had to humble myself enough to get on my freaking knees and say, God, can you help me believe in this? Can you, can you impart some faith to me? so that I can believe in you. And and that worked for me. And it's it's in a way, later on, I found out that was scriptural. I didn't know this, that then, but the Bible says to each man, God has given a measure of faith. And the Bible also tells us to ask, seek, and knock, which implies that we have to humble ourselves to the point that we are going to initiate that relationship with our creator. Now, it's hard to get on your knees and ask a God that you don't believe in to give you the faith to believe in him. And that's a supernatural thing. Faith is a supernatural thing because you're right. You can't fake it, man. Yeah, you can't. Um, and when I did that and when when God imparted that faith to me, it changed everything about me. It, it changed everything about the way I talk. It changed everything about the way I acted. It changed everything about what I do now. When you realize that I can't die. I can't. I'm going to, I'm literally going to live forever. I cannot die. That changes everything. I feel like that could make you take some unnecessary risks. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't mean I can't die in a physical sense. <laughs> I, I, I will, I will suffer, suffer physical death, but I literally go from here to the presence with my creator, right, in, in the blink of an eye. And it changes everything about how you live your life, about what you want to do, what you, the message you want to put out to other human beings. And, and two, because it did change me as a person, it changed my heart. I want everybody to have that, man. I want everybody to have what I have. You know what I mean? And I'm passionate about that, dude. Should be. You know? Um, but I don't know, brother. <laughs> what year was that? That would have been 2012. Okay. Um, so yeah. You, so you did another seven years yeah. after that in the teams. Yeah. So I got out. I got I got saved on deployment. Got back home from that deployment. Uh, completely changed, man. I didn't I, – I, I was just uh, – I, I mean, to be honest with you, dude, I, I was – I was on fire for God, man, and um, and I get back home, my my wife is literally dying from a drug addiction. Like, I walk into the house, and you know, I didn't know it because you know how it is going in. You know, yeah. even even in a training cycle, you know, you're gone, you're gone more you're days gone. than you're home. Yeah, man. Yeah. And so you know, get back home, and she's uh, she's you know in freaking drug induced comas for days at a time, and literally dying. What was her poison? Uh, pills. Yeah. Any, how'd she get started on that path? A long time ago when she was, you know, 15, 16 years old, yeah. she had just been Stuck on and with off, her. but it got so bad to that, you know, to that point that it again could no longer be swept under the rug. Um, were you aware of it up leading up into that point? No. Uh, I mean, I mean, well, well I, I could, I could sense maybe at times something was off, but when I would come home, I wanted to freaking have sex and, uh, hang out and go on a date, and I yep. didn't want to talk about what uh, this might be a little off. What's going on there? I didn't want that. There was no time for those conversations. I yeah. mean, to be honest with you, right or wrong, that's just how that's just how no, I know exactly what you're talking about. And the thing is, if you don't make time for those conversations, I, I say this often if you don't handle the issues, the issues will handle you at some 100%, point. Brother. Just get the timeline long enough, and those issues are going to come back like a bear trap and mm -hmm. snatch you up. Hundred percent, brother, and that's essentially, you know, that's what happened in that situation. It had all come to a head where it was, she, you know, I was about to lose her. Uh, that was going on. My freaking my best friend got hit by a drunk driver. He died, and like just kept kept getting hammered with all this stuff. And I'm like, what in the world, man? But I had this new tool, right? That mm. was prayer, right? Uh, and and that I, I got to see. Dude, I, I I go crazy, man. I, I'd be walking, marching circles around my little house in Virginia Beach, praying that God would deliver my wife from this addiction. Because there was nothing that I could I could say to make her stop. And there's also probably nothing that you could do. Nothing. It's, it's the most helpless I've ever felt. Addiction in my whole life. is something that can only be handled or changed by the person who is addicted. Yep. And that's. Is there anything more rough than seeing somebody destroy themselves like that and doing everything that you can and then finally coming to the realization like, shit, I can't do anything. Nothing, bro. They have to do it on their own. Completely helpless. Yeah. So I hate that feeling too. I hate that helpless mm, feeling. You ain't lying, brother. But you know, I I, I just uh that's all I did, man, is I, I turned to this this God that I now served and kind of leaned into him and leaned into that measure of faith that he had given me. And I said, you know what, God, you know, I've not been serving you long, but I'm going to stand upon these promises that you give me in your word. And, uh, and you know, she come, she comes to me. Uh, I had been home for probably, I don't know, maybe a month or two watching her die. And she finally comes to me one day for no apparent reason and says, hey, I want to get clean. And, um, you know. I'd imagine that was a hard road. That was a hard road, man. Yeah. yeah so the that whole... stuff gets their hooks into you deeply. That prescription pills, man. And that was one of the hardest decisions. I one of the hardest decisions I had to make in the teams is when she did finally come to me and say she wanted to get clean, you know. And then I had to walk walk through this process with her. I remember having to go on, going back to my guys at the SEAL team, man, and being like, "Hey, I'm gonna have to take a knee." Yeah. And man, you want to talk about tough, man. That was really, really tough. But I'm glad I made that decision. I'm glad that I put her, uh, you know, before I, I, I put her where she needed to be yeah. as far as the order of priority in my life. And I think about a, it one. One was just an occupation. 
You yeah, know, yeah, it, man. At the end of the day, they might pound that that trident into your casket, but it was just a job title. That's it, brother. That's it. So she uh, she got clean, and yeah, that was uh, that kind of that really helped set my faith in concrete. Um, and, and a few things that happened on that deployment before we came home also helped. And uh, that's why I believe the way I believe, essentially. I guess you could say that's my testimony. And uh, I want, like I say, I want everybody to have that. And that's a big thread in all the things that we teach and talk about. Mm-hmm. But um, we're, 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 we try to be real with it, man, you know. I think that's all you can do is be honest and real about how you feel. And it, it's going to stick with some people and bounce off others. I mean, you know, I think – Again, watching religion from the outside, I think there's a timing aspect to it as well. You know, it'll hit or stick differently on people depending on where they are in their life and what they're going through. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah. again, I am the least education educated person on the face of the planet to talk about that stuff. So. I'll hear you, brother. Well, hey, brother, I believe if you seek it, I believe you'll you'll find it. But that's on you to seek it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. That's on you. But that's all. That's all I can say about it. How'd you end up standing outside of the president's bedroom while he slept? Oh, we were doing. I, I've we aug- glossed over that one. <laughs> Which president was it? Uh, Obama. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've augmented uh, the Secret Service cat team two di- on two different occasions overseas. How was that? Three different occasions, actually. Um, I wouldn't want the job. You know what I mean? It's reactionary in nature, <laughs> dude. I, I'll never forget, man. I'll never forget being being in Africa. And um, the dude Obama's in this meeting, you know, and we're 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 like his inside. We're we've got the inside perimeter, so we're just outside of the building that he's in. And then we push the local forces out to set an an outside perimeter, and they're not supposed to let anybody get through to us. Like if somebody makes it to us, it's a problem. We're we're supposed to freaking smoke them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cause we're the last line of yeah. defense. You and guys are the mo- you guys are the moat with the dragon in it. That's it, brother. And so I remember this freaking idiot, African dude on a moped, just blows through the the out that outer security perimeter. And of course, all the little local guys they probably don't even have bullets in their guns, and they're just yelling and screaming at him. And he don't freaking give a crap, dude. He's just coming straight at us, man. And um, got a big jacket on, and. I jump out of the SUV that we were in, and this dude's coming right at me, and I'm drawing down on him. But in the back of my mind the whole time, I'm like, if I shoot this dude and he doesn't have a S vest on or he doesn't have a gun, or he doesn't have something on, if I shoot him, they're going to freaking crucify me, man. That's not a position that I want to be in. That's a tough headspace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and he's coming straight at us, man. And he's not slowing down. And you know, I don't shoot the dude. And he gets he gets within our perimeter, and we finally stop him. And he doesn't have anything on him. And, and probably has no idea who's there. Had, or had what's no going clue, on. bro. Yeah. He had no clue. In all reality, I should have killed the dude. But with that particular administration, it, it was um, they didn't like us. And they made it clear they didn't like us. Really? As they look, man, anytime there were cameras around, anything, they did not want any weapon showing. They did not want any kit on. They hamstrung us. They hamstrung us the whole time, man. Hmm. And you you could just you could just get a sense, man, that you if you make a decision, you better be right. Because these cats are not gonna cut you any slack. Yeah. Not that we deserve any slack. But in a situation like that, that was real. That was, I mean, that was a real, that really happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? What do you do? You know, you're told, you're told what to do, but then in the back, you're playing a free, they're, you're a police officer, man. And no, I mean, it was cool. It was cool to get to meet the president a couple of times and this and that, but I, I wouldn't want that job, man. I, I hosted the cat team a couple of times when I was on the East Coast and whew. Just that job of protection. Like you said, there's there's not a lot of offensive maneuvers that you can make because you have to sit there and wait for somebody to yep. do something that then rises to the point where you can respond, whether it be you know taking a lethal action. 
it's just and uh, I just hated that feeling because there's it's hard to describe, you know, drawing down on somebody and having them close the distance so you have to make a decision quickly. And in the back of your mind, you're sitting there like, is this the right thing to do? It is the right thing to do, but am I going to get utterly murdered for me? <laughs> yeah, man. There's a lot of there's a lot of weight and gravitas in that decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's tough. I'm glad there's men that do it, man. And you know, that's not not for me though. And you know, all this mess that's going on now, I tell you, it's going to be. It, we're, we're in some interesting times right now, and I think it would be uh, it would be remiss to not you know comment briefly on on that stuff on, on everything that, that the environment that we're in now as a, as a nation uh, it's, it's so weird man I, my brother bought me this mask because when you fly you got to wear a freaking mask yep or they're not gonna let you on a plane and i thought i'm gonna do an experiment here and my brother bought me a mask and it's just mesh it's literally a piece of mesh like my beard hairs stick through the mask and I'm like, I'm going to wear this thing and see how serious they really are about this thing. I'm going to guess they let you on. They literally, they're... nobody said anything. No, yeah. I've been wearing it. It's some of these places around here you have to wear it. In Georgia, you don't have to freaking wear it. Here, but And in the airport. And I'm like, this is just a freaking game, man. This is literally a game. This is, this is control. It, to me, I've had coronavirus. It knocked my freaking dick in the dirt. I've had I ain't gonna well. lie to you. I take it. I mean, I take it seriously. If you're freaking old or sick, don't or high risk. Yeah. yeah, don't get that mess because it it put a whooping on me, son. I ran a marathon on day five, and it like the daggone killed me. Well, it's because you're probably not supposed to run a marathon on day five. I had to reconcile. some You might stuff. have had some, uh, you know, some culpability. In <laughs> I had to reconcile some stuff within my own head, man. Yeah. But you know, aside from that, and, and look, man. Another conversation that interests me that nobody's having is um, is the history. Look, man, if you look at the history of the rise and fall of any empire throughout human history, it's, and especially most recently, you can look at the Roman Empire. If you see, if you study that, it is astounding. It is the similarities are astounding to what we see going on right now. And you you can predict the next thing that's going to happen. You really can. Huh. It, I am not a student of that stuff. Oh, man, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. And one of the most interesting things to me is, is that the empire, essentially, history will tell you the empire fell around 375 A.D. It fell. But... Nobody even realized that it had fallen. So looking back on it, historians looking back on it, they look at that date and they say, okay, this is essentially it had fell. The, the fact that it had fell, they had essentially lost control. So in that 375 AD, it was the first time that they had these uh, outer civilizations, civilizations that lived on the perimeter of the empire. They called them barbarians. Mm -hmm. They weren't barbarians. That's just what the Romans called them. They were other civilizations. That was the first time that these other civilizations were moving into the confines of the empire and setting up autonomous zones, which essentially tells you that at that point, the empire had lost control, the, the, the government of the empire. Now, leading up to that, what led them to that point where they had lost control of the confines of their empire? It was lavish spending. It was overtaxation. It was moral and ethical decay. It was all the things that you see yeah. playing out right now. It's very, very interesting. And then finally, what toppled it all over is they're trying to take, the, the Empire's trying to take back these autonomous zones from these barbarians, right? And then they get hit with a pandemic. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> the plague. <laughs> I tell you what, the coronavirus, like I said, I've had it too. And uh, the mask thing, I've, you know, I have a buddy named Brian Bishop, and we've had some interesting conversations, and he's not anti-mask. He doesn't like to wear a mask. But I think the handling of it, I do believe there is an aspect of control. But I think the biggest issue is it just highlights the failure of leadership 
at the highest levels of government. And I'm not talking about just the office of the president of the United States. I'm talking about congressmen, senators that, that couldn't even get the messaging correct mm -hmm. or consistent. Because you're not the only person I know of. I mean, p people are like, oh, I'll just wear a chain link fence as a mask. And nobody says anything. I'm not trying to be a dick, man. I just wanted to see how they would react to it. And I... <sighs> I'm not a risk to anybody. I have the antibodies. I, I know. Uh, yeah. I, I breathe antibodies every, every time I exhale. And I do believe it's real. And I don't want anybody to die. And I think that the people that are high risk category, they should absolutely protect themselves. But the government and the people in charge did such a disservice by the way that the information was just bumbled and mishandled and going back and forth. And could some of that be control? I do think a lot of people that seek government service are not trying to seek uh, service of the people that elected them. They're there for themselves and their own empowerment. So yeah, I do believe there is an essence of control. I guess my definition would be contr of control would be they're trying to figure out ways to benefit themselves and fuck everybody else, right? That type of control. Yeah. And then the leadership just poor, I mean, uh, poor communication, poor handling. It just, it sucks. And then now people have very little faith, it seems, in the government, how we're electing our officials. It's not looking so hot on people's faith in that system. The officials themselves. Yeah. Interesting times. And, and and this was this was all part of again history. It's all this this is all this all happened before. Yeah. Nothing that's happening here is new. This has all happened before. And and that's another thing that you saw with the collapse of the Roman Empire specifically is in, in the latter days of that empire just before collapse, you saw the public really withdrawing from their faith in so in other words, the public used to take pride. We used to could take pride in our nation, and some of us still do, me in particular. Same. It hurts my heart. It like hurts me inside to see what our nation is is becoming. Um, I, I, I'll be blatantly honest with you. It is collapsing. Uh, it's. I, I hate to say that. I'm not. Not that's not to scare anybody. Yeah. Um, I'm just comparing it to history, right? And the point we are, and the things we're experiencing, and yeah. It's harder and harder for people to take pride in their nation, to have confidence in their government. And that that's a big issue, man. That's a big freaking issue. If they don't figure out a way to restore confidence in our electoral system by the time the next presidential election comes around, I don't – and again, this is just my personal assessment – I don't think it'll be recoverable. I think that's one of the main issues that they have got to figure out before the next election. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100 percent, man. Because it's two election cycles in a row where people on both sides and, and phew, both sides of the fence are culpable in where we are right now. And of course, it seems that one side is like, it's their fault. And then the other side is like, it's their fault. It's like, yeah, maybe just point one finger at yourself and one at the other person because mm -hmm. it's both your fault. But I don't think our country could tolerate a third election cycle, presidential cycle, where there's no faith in the the system itself yeah. I, that could well be the tipping point yeah i agree man it's uh it's been wild brother um it has been wild i don't like seeing how people are engaging with each other both i mean it's much more explosive and inflammatory in the online world because there's that lack of getting punched directly in the face when you say something that you shouldn't yeah but i am seeing that creeping out beyond the internet and ethernet and all of those worlds and i don't know again well, i find myself in a place where i don't have any answers but i have concern well you know and my wife told me the other day I, I was talking through some of this stuff with her because i've really kind of tried to delve into that uh that his that historical aspect of the rise and fall of empires read a few books on it and educated myself mm -hmm. uh just so I think it's valuable because you can in turn posture yourself and put yourself in a position. If you can literally have at least an idea or a theory of what's coming next, that helps tremendously in, in your own preparation as a human being. 100%. Um, and she's like, well, the economy was pretty good for the last two years. And I'm like, you realize that was a facade. We're trillions of dollars in debt. And you're telling me that the economy was good. Like the economy of this nation is, it's a facade. Just because we we as individuals in our own little communities are are making money and trading with each other, uh, for and we have a few good years, like 
if you look deeper into the economy of our nation, I, it's it's I, I don't know how you can ever recover. I don't. It's monopoly money. We have yeah. monopoly money. Literally, they sending me this money. You know what I do? I go out and buy a gun. Because I, I was in Salt Lake City the other day at a restaurant, and I tried to pay for my meal with cash. They wouldn't take. They it literally it. would not take my cash. <laughs> at, at that point. It was monopoly money. It was worthless. I could not trade that t- legal tender for food. Yeah. Um, now that's an isolated incident, but this is this is just how I believe. So, what would history say will happen next? Well, what happened in the the Roman Empire was eventually it gets to the point that the that the illusion that we are still in control. Uh, as as a nation of ourselves and our government, that illusion can no at some point will no longer be able to be maintained, and then life still goes on. It's not it's not the end of the world when that happens. Yeah, there's not a mushroom cloud. No, it, it, all that happens in the case of uh, the historical evidence is the empire just fractures into multiple individual kingdoms or states, and. And life goes on. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's not the end. And and man, I hope it doesn't come to that. To be honest with you, this is an interesting conversation for me because it's interesting. Really, though, the heart of everything that I do, I wouldn't have this conversation if it wasn't your listeners can handle this conversation. I wouldn't have this conversation with Rich Roll or any of them other cats because people can't freaking handle it. I'm interested in spiritual things, man. Yep. You know that that's really what I, that's really what's driving me right now. I love looking into this stuff. I love history because I love history, and I think it's smart to be aware of what's going on within your community, within your nation. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't just turn a blind eye and be completely ignorant of it. But it's not the freaking end of the world, man. Yeah, you know. And it's also not going to be easy. You know, there's no solution that's going to be a light switch going on and off. It'll be. It'll if. If the erosion, which I would agree with you, there are many metrics for me that I have serious cause for concern. To stop that erosion, first you would need to baseline it and then start to rebuild. And that is not a matter of minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, or it's multiple years. It's generational in nature. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, well, the only theories, the only predictions that we can uh, really, the, the only lot, the only theory theories that have any merit half for me personally is from looking back at history. That's the only way that I can have my own theory of what's coming next and it has some form of merit. You know, um you hear we're far less unique and special than I think we would like to believe. Like we are creating stuff. It's like eh. You might be creating things, but let's you're using it for the same purpose that somebody else created yeah. something for in the past and multiple it, times, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, this is another real benefit about being a part of the kingdom of God, Andy, is you know that, you, uh, that we are part of a kingdom that has endured the fall of many empires. You're part of a kingdom that has... Uh, look, at, look, at, look at Christianity in and, in and of itself... You had you had these twelve dudes that were fishermen. They were handpicked by this freaking Jewish dude named Jesus. They nailed him to the cross. What did all the twelve of those dudes do? They freaking ran off. They denied him. They quit. They said it's all over. Right? And then all of a sudden, they come back out of nowhere and start what is the the New Testament Christianity, the new covenant. And it spread throughout the entire world and endured for thousands of years. How did that happen? How did these dudes go from from fleeing and saying, screw this, man, to all of a sudden creating this new covenant and religion that's endured for thousands of years? The only answer to that to me is they saw that joker when he rose from the dead. All those, those 12 disciples, they said, all right, this is all over. I'm out. They even were asking, weren't you with that dude named Jesus? Uh, Peter said, no, I don't know who that is, right? I don't know. It's, it's all there. But then all of a sudden, he, when, he came, when he came out of the tomb, they saw him and they were like, holy crap, that dude just rose from the dead. And that changed the game. I can see that changing people's minds. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Yeah. And so and so then these guys were able to stand up this kingdom, this body of Christ that has now endured. And they stood it all up while being oppressed by that Roman Empire. The Roman Empire saw the Christian when I say church, I mean the body of all the Christians. They saw them as a threat, mm-hmm. right? So they were freaking killing them as fast as they could kill them. This thing has now endured for thousands of years and throughout the rise and fall of no telling how many freaking empires, and it's still here, man. And that's the part, that's the kingdom that I'm a part of, man. And I don't know, that feels good to me. Yeah. That's another reason I want everybody to have what I have. You know what I mean? I have no doubt. Shifting topics. Sorry, bro. No, it's good. Trust me. I I am open to exploring and talking about absolutely anything. It's my favorite aspect of the podcast is I get to sit down and have conversations with people that, like you about things like this. And I'll tell you where I reach the limits of my knowledge, and I'll tell you where I don't know what I believe or where I land, and it is what it is. Yeah. Oh, you have the hard conversations, Andy. I try you, to. You do a good job at that. Easy man. conversations, uh, they're kind of boring, mm-hmm. I guess. I agree. Where did your passion for running ridiculously long distances come from? That's a good question. and uh, It's the activity that I made despise the most. You know, I, I really, <laughs> I went out on a little mission this morning up in these mountains to some lake called Strawberry Lake. I see. I'm going to um, have to Google that. Yeah. What'd you get yeah. into this morning? Because you we were texting last night. You're saying you're going to get a run in. And then you said that today it's a run slash hike. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I almost hit you up last night. Say, hey, man, you want to go running? And I was like, I bet Andy Would've freaking a, hates two running. Two letter response. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, yeah. Th- t- this morning was awesome, man. I just got out and got in the mountains. My beard froze. Um, it's a little chilly out. Yeah, I got to see some big cat. I got in this spot. Uh, I, you know, I got in this spot where what is it? Aspen trees? Are those aspen trees? <sighs> Again, now we're okay. at a place where I don't know I, a damn thing. I think they're aspens. The, you know, the they're they're evergreens and the limbs grow all the way down to the ground. And I was on this little single track trail at the foothills of these massive freaking mountains. And I'm going, and there's rabbits all in there. And I see in the rabbit tracks everywhere, and then I see a set of big rabbit tracks and some big cat paw prints <laughs> right behind it. And they were pretty fresh, too, in the snow. Yeah. And I was like, all right, buddy. Well, you there's know? cats out here for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. So I just, just got out exploring this morning. You know, it's, I, I really love that. I love land, I love land nav. Um, I love teaching land nav and, and getting out and having those, I call them missions. You know, it It's just, such a great skill to have, though, too. Yeah, Even just is. to be able to read a topo map. To oh yeah, orient and be able to. It's, you'll never be lost. We te- yeah, and we teach that to all our students, and it's yeah. astounding. We have not had a student yet, and we trained forty eight people last year. We have not had a student yet that had any knowledge whatsoever of how to use a map and a compass, and it's a very simple skill, but it's being lost. It's thirty to forty five minutes of explanation, and then the rest can be practical. And I mean, once you have a compass, a topo map. You're never going to be lost again. You don't got to worry about batteries. You don't yeah. got to worry about freaking satellite. You don't, nothing, man. You're good to go. Yeah, it was one of my, I enjoyed doing those evolutions as well. Yeah. I was a point man for a long time too, and it's. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I loved it for two platoons. And then when I was over on the East Coast as well, I was walking point for that. And it just, I always enjoyed it. And I almost never pulled out a compass or a GPS. I, I, terrain navigation is terrain the way to go. Terrain association. Yeah, yep. man. It's the 100%. way to go. Yeah, but so don't. So I was getting. Don't out, dodge the. I was question. getting out. I, I, <laughs> that that time in my life that I told you I was freaking going crazy because they were sending me all these doctors and stuff. Um, a buddy of mine approached me and said, "Hey, man, I'm going to go do this 50 mile race." He was a team guy too, and he's. I didn't even know freaking people could run 50 miles. I, I didn't say how much were you running at that point? Uh, like none. Like none. Which is the correct amount you yeah. should run. Oh, yeah. And, and in the teams, man, it was not practical to be a freaking ultra marathon runner. I mean, you're putting on... you, you Pre-9-11, about- you might have been surprised. There was two camps of people, the triathlete group and then the Steel Palace okay. group. And that was... It was... You kind of picked and choose. Well, I mean... Pick dude- and chose, however you would say that. But yeah, there was, there was a lot more endurance-based running. But... I didn't start wearing plates everywhere until post 9-11. Okay. Right? Like the training rucks were nothing in comparison to the rucks that I would carry overseas. So I think that methodology 
flipped. Yeah, my whole career. Pretty rapid. Yes. Yeah, we were we were kitted out, and you know, yeah. you carrying a Mark Forty Six or a Mark Forty Eight with a full combat loadout and water and food and running a marathon you need. a day is not the training no, program. Negative, for that. man. Yeah. So I wasn't running much, and my buddy, I, I knew I was, I knew pretty much that my career was going to come to an end. So I was pretty bent out of shape because I still wanted something to test myself on a high level and just to stay sharp, man, and to continue to compete, continue to thrive. You know, being a SEAL, there's a there's an aspect of competition as a SEAL, not only uh, amongst you and your, your brothers. You know, you guys hold each other accountable. And, and Let's just be honest. Everything in the SEAL teams is a competition. Everything, man. And I love that. I mean, that's part of the fibers of my being. We used to race. I mean, go out, get drunk, and you'd be standing at a urinal next to your buddy racing to see who could pee faster. That's how <laughs> deeply down the competitive nature goes. And, of course, you were racing to drink your beer before you went to the urinal, as it is anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I will say I've always been halfway decent at running. Um, I've never, I never really – shown off with it or anything the only time i shown off with it was in in seal training uh one time a buddy of mine um i had i spit a big chew of tobacco on his boots that he had just polished pissed him off he filled my boots up with sand that night we were on the island san clemente and we woke up the next morning and go out for chow pt up al huey yep and um he challenges me to a race in front of the whole class there and of course the whole class none of them knew i could run they all knew that dude could run he was always first and uh, i smoked him up out here <laughs> and the whole i turn around the whole class is like what the freaking crap just happened dude so i've always been a decent runner um but i wanted something to challenge me on a high level my buddy told me about that race it was a 50 mile long mountain race and i went and i did it and it freaking crushed me dude because i did it with like very very minimal training and it put a hurting on me and I, that's what's going to happen if you go into that with minimal training <laughs> oh yeah it yeah. should be expected if you're listening to this if you don't take the time to train for that it's going to spank you but see that's not the way my mind works <laughs> i'm just like oh man if this is humanly possible then yeah i can i'm, no, I, I'm gonna go do it you don't know? get me wrong i appreciate the headspace i'm just saying yeah. for people listening if you attempt that same maneuver it's it's going to be you're going to be a little bit sore from basically the top of your head to the bottom of your feet brother in the south we we call that being stove up i was stove up brother <laughs> i have not heard that term I'm, before i'm here to tell you man <laughs> um but you know it hit the spot for me dude and then i went and from there i did pretty well actually uh and my buddy that i ran the race with he said, man, you could you could be competitive at this. And I thought, well, maybe I could. So uh, I went and signed up for a 100-mile race. And my first 100-mile race was uh, called the Cruel Jewel. It had 33,000 feet of elevation gain and loss over the course of 106 miles. So it's one of the hardest 100-milers in the, I guess, in the nation, definitely in the southeast really rough terrain really rough trails you're supposed to qualify for it of course i called the race director i pulled my navy seal card said hey man i'm about to retire from the seal teams could you let me run this race and they said yeah and i got eighth place out of a feel a a, a feel a world people came from all over the world to run this thing and especially all over the nation the jump from 50 to 100 miles so it's twice the distance is it twice as difficult it becomes a game of patience so it doesn't necessarily hurt any worse so you reach i personally i reach this point i call it the steady state where the pain is what it is and you come to accept the pain for what it is now i'm not trying to sound tough here but you just realize that this is as bad as it's going to hurt unless something breaks yeah which something i mean i have torn muscles and stuff like that and that that stops you in your tracks but um you get in that steady state around that 50 mile mark usually for me 50 to 60 miles and from that point forward man it's it's constant forward motion it's being patient enough to continue to move forward and to accept the pain that you're feeling for what it is until you reach the finish line and patience is something that uh, I think a lot of people are missing. It's a it's a it's a virtue or, or an attribute that's missing in a lot of people's lives. And a hundred mile race for me is a is a practice of patience. Really, it is, man. Um, and, and then too, not letting that pain get to your head. 
again, breaking things down into small digestible segments. I was just going to say, how easy could it be to just get overwhelmed? I'm 50 miles in, and instead of thinking, I'll just take these next miles as they come, you're like, 50 more to go. People would just be hitting the ejection seat. Oh, yeah, 100%, man. Because <laughs> even, even when you're at 70... And you still got thirty miles. You have over left, a marathon man. left to go. Yeah. And these races are in, in not these races are aren't on a freaking paved road. Yeah. I mean anything in, but it seems. They're in rough terrain. You're out in the elements, it's nasty. Um so yeah, that's what it becomes. And like I say, that's what allows me to, to really be competitive at these. It's really not because I'm the fastest. Uh, I train, you know, I'd say average training week for me, unless I'm really serious about winning a race, mm-hmm. um, thirty miles a week running 30 40 miles a week which is which is crazy very could, easy yeah and you, know? you would like huh that's a third of the distance well you know less than a third of the distance for a hundred miler and then you could go out and ex- yeah that's crazy i would have i would have guessed you would have had to have been closer to the the distances that you were going to compete at if you wanted to run 100 miles right now yeah which i don't uh, but, for but clarity. If, and i never will if you decided you did <laughs> because you are who you are and and you and i share very common a very common mindset, although you're much smarter than me. Um, it's not an accurate statement, but I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> Come on. Uh, <laughs> you could go out and run 100 miles. You know, yeah, the, phys- <sighs> mentally and physically. I mean, you're, you're in good shape. I mean, you, you, might, you, you might tear a hamstring or something like that, but you're going to get it done, man, because you know— I might how- end up walking at the end, but yeah. Yeah, you, you know how to execute those principles that have kept— men like you and I really essentially kept us alive um, in different times and places. Yeah. So it becomes easy for us to execute on those principles uh, out on the trail in a controlled environment. You know what I mean? I do. Those same principles that when I go and publicly speak, I'm talking about those same things executed in a boardroom perspective or an office perspective or from a leadership perspective. It's not magic, but if you can wrap your head around them, you can do some magical stuff. Yeah. And you know, one of the, one of the most one of the craziest things i had a dude one time at a it was actually at one of those last man standing races his longest race that he had ever ran was a 10k and uh, i took him 100 miles that day um by just teaching him those principles we're talking about one of the most powerful principles that's allowed me uh to endure in these races is i call it the power of the spoken word right the things that come out of our mouth and that's one of the things i like about you is I think you're very you're articulate because you don't waste words. I think you you think about every word that you say. I've been known to ramble. Don't get well, me wrong. Well, yeah, but but still, <laughs> it's it's articulated <laughs> rambling. Um, and you know that that's that's probably one of my biggest tools. You know, it's so easy to run past people on these races, and you say, "Hey, you know, how you doing?" You know, how's your race going? And, that, you know, maybe they're in a bad place and they're like, oh, you know, I've had even something as simple as, oh, I've had a, I've had better days or, you know, this is hurting or that's hurting. Instead of just saying freaking, dude, I'm doing outstanding. Even if it freaking sucks, man. Yeah. I mean, you know. and, and False that, motivation is better than no motivation. It, it really is, man. And, and here's the thing. I'm not saying that you can speak things into existence. I'm saying that it, your mind is very, very powerful. And and those words that you say can change your mindset and what your mind thinks is happening. And especially, that's where the power is. Especially as you're getting pressed into those places where you're discovering who you really are. The power of, you know what I mean? It's the same thing as buds. I would wait until hell week. Wait until they were tired and cold and wet and hungry and try to speak thoughts of quitting into their mind. There you go, brother. And, and they're more receptive. I mean, if you catch somebody... Uh, not on a hell week Monday morning, like pff, what you can say whatever you want to. They don't care, right? Because they have that armor up. You strip that armor away, and that power of influence is it's hard to describe. For me, when I, when things suck, uh, and they do often, but whether it's physically or mentally, I, I tell myself, you know, I can always do one. Or like, you know, you're working out, you're doing an uh, exercise, something like that, and you want to put the bar down. I can always do one, or just take the next step. That's it's that power and just verbalizing that, like you said, it can change your entire perspective, which can, of course, change the entire outcome of whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. Very yeah. powerful. It really is, man. And that's something I take very seriously in my own life. And, you know, I don't cuss, man. And a lot of people think, well, Chad's a freaking Bible thumper. He doesn't cuss. And it's like, 
No, that's not what it is. It's it's just the fact that I have done the best that I can possibly do to take control over every single thing that comes yep. out of my mouth. Right, right. Literally, God's word said says your tongue is the rudder of your life. Right, and we know what a rudder is and how it works. It's a little bitty thing yeah. that's set right here in this powerhouse that is your brain and your your head, and it literally can control the direction of your life. Um, and you know, it's, it's worked for me. It's helped me tremendously. You know, that's just another tool that, uh, I would challenge everybody that's listening to this to try to, to try to be cognizant of those things that you're saying, especially in moments when life gets tough, right? And everybody around you is complaining it's and whining and the most critical time to keep track of what comes out of your mouth. Brother. Yeah. A hundred percent. And make sure that what comes out of your mouth is commensurate with your behavior, because if they're going in different directions, you're going to have issues regardless of who you are and what seat you're sitting in. It's one of the biggest things I see in leadership failures is they say one thing and they do another. You know what we call that? Hypocrisy. Indeed. We call that hypocrisy. Indeed. Yes. Lord knows I've seen plenty of hypocrisy, <laughs> especially being in this uh, in the arena that I'm in of, of professing my faith in God and a lot of the people that I deal with are in that yeah. same arena. Hey, I've found myself being a hypocrite times in my life as well, too. You know, it's yeah, I yeah. do my best to put those in the uh, smaller column and more of not being a hypocrite in the in the column. That's there more, you go, brother. More full. <laughs> so do you. I mean, it sounds to me like the running for you is that continuation of that challenge. I bet. And I, I would assume I like I said, have no desire and will never, unless put at gunpoint, run a distance over like 100 yards. And even if I was at gunpoint, I probably would try to figure out a way to take the gun from somebody <laughs> versus running that distance. You've got a special set of skills to be able to handle that situation, <laughs> just don't you? despise running. But it seems like it, it's you're using it as that tool to mentally and physically challenge yourself. That's all it is, man. And another thing, too, is it helps keep me on the ground level, man. With with Look, man, people... People look at the stuff that you and I are putting out, man. And um, it, again, just like you said, if we're not living it, yeah. then it, look, if, you're, if your coach or your mentor hasn't done crap, and if they're not doing crap, why are they your coach or your mentor? Like, I, you can only ride the wave of a past accomplishment for so long. A ship does not sail on yesterday's wind. So... Doing these really tough endurance events is a way for me to stay in the mix in my own life to where, you know, when we have students out or when I go give a, a speech, I don't feel I, I feel qualified yeah. because I'm like, yeah, man, I just freaking practice. I just put all this stuff I'm about to teach you. I just put it into practice and I won something that was really hard. That gives me confidence, man. And, you know, so it does play a role in, in that manner, too. It, it, it can helps, can, I guess, give me some credibility. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm a humble person. There's a difference between humility and confidence. Oh, right? absolutely. You, you can be confident and still practice humility in your life. You know what I mean? I do. But running, to me, it's now, I think it's, it's morphing into, uh, I, I'm not racing a whole lot are there now, even a lot of races going on in the uh, There wasn't last year. Yeah, so yeah, um, but, you know, I'll probably run two two races this coming up, or this year now. I'll probably run two races, and then I want to go set the fastest known time record on a long trail in North Georgia, North Alabama, called the Penhody Trail. How long is it? 335 miles. What is the current record? Five days and 16 hours. What do you think is possible? Uh, I think I can do it in the four four day range yeah i don't know if i could do it in sub four three 335 is a little long to run all in one shot and this is this is in mountainous terrain right yeah. again i don't i don't run i don't pick flat trails or anything i want to be in the mountains um so I, i'm really for me i think it's morphing into more of this um it's more like i want missions I, i'll still race a couple times a year because i enjoy that competitiveness but, you know, you set out to set a world record on a trail that's existed for a long time, and it's 335 miles, and it's unsupported. Yeah. Um, there's oh, a, the entire time it's unsupported? Yeah. So yeah. you got to run with all your food? Or can you cache stuff? You can cache okay. stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot. That becomes like, it becomes like a mission, man. Like oh, for a, sure. There's a lot of, 
I, I enjoy, uh, you know, I think it's just, again, in the, within the fibers of our beings to want to wanna plan and execute these these really cool, complex missions. I think it helps me connect to my past, and it helps me, you know, gives me credibility moving forward, um, which I think is important. There's so much crap, dude, on... There's so many of these cats on the freaking social media, and I've been and hung out with some of them that got millions of followers, that got millions of dollars, and I look at these cats and I'm like, what have you done? What? How? how? Uh, It's freaking mind-boggling to me. I don't want to be that person, man. If I ever accumulate financial wealth... I'm going to tell you how I did it, and I'm hope, uh, hopefully it's going to be visible to you of how I did it. And then you're going to go buy guns, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I, that's one of my biggest weaknesses is I'm not driven by money. That, that hurts me in business, man. Um, it might hurt you in business financially, but I think that that could pay dividends in the long run. Or it provides you more financial opportunity in the long run. Yeah. I've made some decisions in my life that were specifically about money. Like, I want to make this amount per year. Because I had a very different perspective about money then than I did now. I used to think it was about what you make. Now it's like it's actually about what you spend. Because if you don't spend a lot, you don't need to make that much. Yep. And, um, you, you know, you, the things that you buy and accumulate, they're not, they're not going anywhere with you. When you come to the end of the road... <laughs> You know, so maybe recalibrate again. People do what you want to with money, but for me, it was huge. And I just made some poor decisions occupationally that, or stayed at a company that I should have left years before just about money. Yeah. And it's like, God, I'm so unhappy. I didn't enjoy the people that I was working with. I wasn't fulfilled by the job. Why did I stay? And I think about it. I'm like, because of the paycheck. I'm like, never again. Yeah. You know? So I'm glad I made those mistakes, but it's, it's been powerful for me to be able to avoid things because oftentimes, in the modern world, what I find people will lead with the money, and it's very attractive, but you got to take a pause and think a little bit deeper because the check up front, whew, man, that's not going to be helping you years down the road mm. when you're still suffering the pain of those choices. I've, I've had to do that multiple yeah. times uh, just in this last year, man. I mean, we I, I had a brand that tried to buy everything that I do. And oh, they, really? They offered me a, a, a million bucks. Yeah. And, uh, I told him no. A and, million and, bucks is a lot of money, but what if it's the million bucks and you have to sp- split over thirty years? It, it's substantially less. Exactly. So I, I now I am who I am, and and the way I the way I work as an entrepreneur is I really try to make my decisions in everything, even in life, not just as an entrepreneur, but I try to adhere to a standard. So I make my decisions based off the standard that I've chosen to live my life by. And then I let the results fall where they may. Yep. So a perfect example, two examples of this. I, I ran a 100 miler the other day. Uh, when, when I show up to a race, people expect me to win. And I'm there to win. I'm going to try to freaking beat you. That's always, I, that's my goal. Mm-hmm. I'm running this race. I get 60 miles in, my stomach blows up. I cannot even stand up straight. It hurts so bad. I have to lay down on side of the trail in the fetal position until I can stand up and walk again. At that point, the result's out the window, right? But what is my standard? My standard is I will never freaking quit. I'm going to get this thing done. My standard is, well, look, I knew I couldn't win the race. Why didn't I just cut the course a little bit? Why prolong my misery? Because I live by a standard of integrity and honor. Honor is the adherence to what is right. Those are the standards I live by, right? So when the results go out the window, I try to live my life by a standard. Now, in a business, we have an experience. We just did the first one the other day called the Proving Grounds. We rent this camp out. It's freaking awesome. And it costs $30,000 to rent this camp. Well, I put this, I built out this whole curriculum, put it out on Instagram, and I thought, man, people are going to be hungry for this. Right. And it was right when the this this wave of coronavirus that we're writing right now, it was right as it was really ramping up. And I put it out. I thought, man, we'll get 70 people for this right off the bat. And. Like just trickle, they just trickle in, man. And at the end, we've got like 14, 15 people signed up and my partners call me. Now, I own the company, but I have. I have obviously co-instructors. They, yeah. they don't own the company, but I call them my partners. They're like, Chad, what do we do, man? What do we do? And, you know, 
uh, I'm like, we, we don't, we barely have enough money coming in to even break even on this experience. But I know this experience is going to be powerful. And there is a certain group of men and women that have rogered up for this. I'm not going to fail them. I am not going to fail them. They want this. They have decided to show up, to toe the freaking line in order to, to grow as human beings. And I'm not going to fail them. So my business partners call me and I say, I don't care if I lose $10,000. I am not going to cancel this event. Because guess what everybody else is doing? Canceling Every events, other yeah. freaking event has been canceled. And there, and there are still people out there that, that are hungry, man. They're hungry to learn. They're hungry to grow. They're hungry to, to make progression in their life and be better people. And they're looking to people like us to provide that environment. And, and that's what I do, man. That's my mission. That's my whole business. And, and so I told them straight up, negative. So we, you know, we, we carried it on. We, we did it. And it made a tremendous impact on the 13 that did Roger up. And I wouldn't trade it for any dollar amount. And those 13, that, that the cascading effects of that will have an impact so much greater. And yeah. you can look at it as lessons learned, figure out what worked. What You know what I mean? It's just, That's your mod one. Yeah, I of, don't, I, and I don't market for anything. Everything that we do is organic. So I've never ran an Instagram ad. I, I've never I've never paid for marketing, I guess is what I'm saying. So th I think there's things that we could have done that, that, like you said, there's lessons learned. There's things that we yeah. could have done to maybe have put it out. But now, the reason I don't market is the people, people that come out to train with us, I want them to know who I am. I don't want them to, to see some ad banner on social media and click it and say, oh, this looks cool and freaking sign up. I want them to have some sort of connection and, and know who I am, but because I'm about to start hitting them with some crazy mess, man. I'm gonna be talking <laughs> about Jesus. I'm gonna be talking about not quitting. I'm gonna be pushing. You know, we're we're gonna we're we're digging into all these aspects, all these realms of body, soul, and spirit, and it would freak somebody out that think they're signing up for some hammer session, uh, seal PT weekend with a seal. That's not what we do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's important to me and maybe that's why I don't advertise, but I don't know. That's just two examples of living and making decisions based off the standard that you've chosen to live your life by and not based off of emotion or based off of the result that you thought you could achieve. Your emotions are terrible leaders. They are wonderful servants. They make you who you are. But if you allow them to lead you in business and life and whatever you're doing, you are going to freaking fail, right? It's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, the young emotional leaders were oftentimes the most challenging in our previous occupation. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, I, man, I'll never forget. I'll never forget seeing a uh, one of our platoon chiefs. Um, we were in a situation. You probably know the dude. I'm not going to say his name. I don't know if he's still in, but... I remember we were in this situation where freaking crap was going haywire, man. And he, all my team, not all my teammates, but I remember seeing, I, I can just see this in my in my mind's eye, seeing teammates of mine just like running back and forth like freaking chickens with their head cut off. And, it's, and, and I look over and the chief is sitting in a chair like this on comms and he's just talking, man, just as calm, cool collected he's coming up with a plan he's no emotion involved and yeah. i'm like man that is the man that i want to be you know that it's a powerful example that was the first example i'd ever seen of that dynamic of allowing logic to lead you instead of emotion yeah it was I've, i'll never forget that i had some senior enlisted leaders that were exactly like that and it left such a mark on me that it was all i ever wanted to emulate Spoiler alert, I wasn't perfect. It's been a few times in the old life, in the old job where I let the emotions get a hold of the reins. It sucked. Yeah. <laughs> Made some mistakes. Fortunately, they were in training environments. But again, I mean, I just, I try to learn from the mistakes that I make because they are a plenty and just try not to repeat them. 100%, man. So. And I, I actually think that, well, I don't know what was easier. I find myself that the harder, the harder environment to practice this principle is in places like marriage, 
um, and, and uh, it's, you know, in, in everyday life, that's where it's been really challenging to me to adhere to that principle because a lot of times in the teams, uh, you know, you're at least surrounded by dudes that are going to hold you accountable when you do start to allow those emotions to take over and hopefully yeah. they reel you in with, Quickly. The, with the quickness. Yeah, they're not going yeah. to not going to give you too much rope. They're yeah. going to snatch you back to reality pretty but quick. But when you're dealing with your freaking wife at home or, you know, something, you know, what whatever or or you're a business owner like I am, you know, all none of my people I mean, I, I hate to say they're not going to hold me accountable because I think they would if it got bad enough, but they look to me. You yeah. know what I mean? And Don't be afraid to tell them and empower them to hold you accountable. Oh, I, I, no, I do. Yeah. I do. I mean, you know, and that's that's one of the – yeah, we won't go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what do you got planned for 2021? Um, Business side, you can do some more events? Yeah, so, we're, events? so, so our, 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 like, backpacking trips, that we call it the basic course – um, those are in the North Carolina, Tennessee line in a, in a wilderness area. We take it, take people out for three days. Um, we'll run one of those a month during the summer. And then we're going to run another proving grounds in April. We probably won't do another one of those this year. Um, I want to grow the podcast, man. I want to pour my heart and soul into that. Uh, I wouldn't mind going and doing a little more speaking. Yeah. Um, you know, if it pops up, but it is what it is. That one's outside of our control. That comes back or it doesn't. Yeah. And that's not our decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's tiered for me, man. It's like the podcast. And then if you want to, if you want the opportunity to make a little more, um, real impact is the speaking engagement yep. and then the most real and permanent impact is is really the coming together to actually train intentionally which is what we do through the basic course and stuff yeah. like that yeah that physical interaction really solidifies a lot of the lessons with small groups and you know my business plan is is a terrible business plan it can't be scaled because we we only work with teams of uh like eight people the basic course it's an eight person class we couldn't make it bigger if we wanted to because we're limited to the number of people we can take in the areas yeah um to to minimize the footprint but you know you get much over eight or ten people and you know you you don't get to spend that that you know everybody's like well what what was that what was that chad said you know and, and i don't want it to be that way man yeah. and and i do this stuff man because i freaking care dude i mean i literally care in you know that's what's that's what's driving me so you know we're gonna keep leaning into that and figuring stuff out as we go and then i want to break that pinhody trail record uh probably race a couple times and that'll be it sounds like a relatively full year yeah it'll be fun my it'll goal for 21 2021 is just be alive at the end of it i haven't even broken it down to uh the granular goals that you have <laughs> well and dude we just moved into this farm this ranch in north georgia on like like i told you it's like 500 acres and surrounded by all this public land and gosh dude i'm just i'm loving life man that's I awesome mean, you know. for people who are interested where can they find you yeah um i appreciate that andy just uh three of seven project.com the number three of the number seven project.com or you can follow me on instagram if you want for however much longer that thing's going to be up and running uh <laughs> It's Chad Wright 278. The podcast is uh, 3 of 7 Podcast. It's spelled out on the podcast, 3 of 7 Podcast, wherever podcasts are found. Um, if you want to listen, uh, let me know what you think of it because, yeah, the, the the way I run, the way my, my whole view on my business is, is that it's so, it's bigger than me. So I've, I've designed my business the way that Christ designed his um, following. So I view my customers as the body of the business so i'm like you guys are the body of the podcast of the events of everything that we do so let me know what you think about it because i'm going to change it and make it what you guys want it to be y'all y'all yeah. are the body of it if y'all want to do something different i'm down man i'll, I'll we'll freaking we'll, we'll build something else out you know so yeah i love the interaction with the <clears throat> with the people that follow and listen it's cool it's been fun man it's awesome dude i can't Thank you enough for making the travel up here. We've been at this for over three hours. Are you freaking serious, yeah. dude? Closing wow. thoughts by Chad. The um, floor is yours. Uh, you know, look, guys, I got a freaking simple mind. Uh, closing thoughts is just to to thank you, Andy. I mean, I don't know if it's thoughts or not, but you know, it's a uh, you're a very powerful dude, man. And um, you, you're very, like I say, you're very intelligent, very well articulated. I respect you on a high level. And to be honest with you, it's a little intimidating to come into your lair. 
and uh, and have these conversations. I've never thought of this as my lair, but now I will only think of this as my lair. There you go, brother. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and, and to share what you've built with me is uh, is really an honor. It really is because I know my pleasure, man. I know a little bit of what it took to build what you've built. Not I, that you've been at it a lot longer than me, so I don't know the full spectrum, but I know a little bit of what it took. I'll and, fill you in on all the mistakes <laughs> I made, so you can so, skip them along the way. You know, just thank you so much, brother, uh, for sharing with me, man. Really oh, do appreciate it. My man. pleasure, man. Love you, thank you. Thank you again to Ladder Life Insurance for supporting this episode of the podcast. Ladder makes it quick and easy to get covered for life insurance. To lock in your best rate today and get your family covered with Ladder. Go to ladderlife.com slash cleared hot. That's it for the week, everybody. Thank you. Understand the West Bank of the River? That's a farm, West Bank, and gives me hell. Still give it to me in the Grove. Okay, one's in from the north. I've got the West Bank of the River. Two's going to give it to you in the Grove. Roger, give me that gun run. Right along that bad, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube, I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com and there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab, and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you can tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, see you.